Hey, good evening, Comic Card fans. Welcome to another exciting show here on the Comic Card Live channel. It's good to have everybody here and chatting early, as we always like to see at Delfredo. And Mikhail, you were here really early trying to claim artwork that isn't for sale. We always appreciate that kind of uh, enthusiasm before things get started. So, uh, so welcome to the show. Still, uh, I'm still getting my my. I'm getting rid of my con legs. It's been a very. Uh, I'm trying to. Uh, shake the cobwebs after that long long weekend and the uh all the fun we got to have but i'm finally back up to uh to speed i think maybe not with emails i haven't got caught up there yet but uh, with most other things that i needed to get done and uh, relaxation i finally got there hey doug nice to see you nice talking with you the other day as well as as with many of you in the chat but uh i'm gonna bring a gentleman on who many of you who were at heroes this past weekend probably hung out with and got got the the chance to meet him and talk with him in person but we're going to do it again tonight and uh because many of you weren't at the show and maybe have never met my guests so let's bring on benno rothschild hey benno how are you bill how are you i am fantastic awesome awesome yeah you know we are back from heroes i'll tell you what it was a great <laughs> show so uh, yeah we've got to stop yeah. meeting like this benno <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly uh, well you know we met at the bar that was a good place to meet that was a good place to meet. I got to see some of your originals there too, so that was nice too. Yeah, that worked out well. That uh, I tell you what, that bar at the Westin, uh, it is it is super fun to be at a show where you know when you walk into that bar, you know, at least uh, eighty percent of the time, if it's after six or seven o'clock, you're going to run into people you know, and you're going to see creators that you you know have want to know if you don't know them already so it's a lot of fun oh yeah no without question i mean that i it's everything i remembered it being i mean i hadn't been there for 14 years but um but it was just as good as i remembered if not better I've, i had a I even had a call like felix gave me a call to talk about something i'll say and he was like man that was like the best con i've been been to in, in an incredibly long time i mean i think everybody walked away from that show just feeling great about the hobby and the fact that, uh, you know, it really was one of uh, those kind of spectacular times to be together. And like you said, you'd never get a show where there's so many people, uh, creators as well as collectors hanging out in uh, the same location after a show's over. Or usually, you know, everybody's breaking, going out other places, but during Heroes, you know, by and large, the, uh, they do a good job of kind of keeping you around the hotel, whether it's the drink and draw, the art auction, and uh yeah i think know. people scatter for dinner and then they sort of come back together at the hotel which is a really nice thing and, and honestly i think this year in particular though there was a real push to have art collectors there more so than i'd seen there were a lot of people that i knew through the appa through calf through various things um that made plans to meet up at that show mm -hmm. hey we haven't done this in a long time it's been you know, we've we've all gone through this couple of years where we didn't get to do things, and um, and a lot of people are like, let's let's pick heroes as the place we're going to meet up. Yeah, no, that was exactly what it was like. I mean, it worked out really well. I mean, I was talking about it for a long time, saying, you know, this is going to be my first show back, and anybody that wanted to kind of finally get the opportunity to meet in person, that'd be a good show for it. I think a lot of people did. So you, the app, I had a had a dinner, right? Yeah, I think we had a, we had a dinner on Friday night. Uh, which was a ton of fun. And, you know, for me, that dinner in particular, but I mean, really other things that, that the, the Thursday night dinner that you hosted and even, and Friday, a lot of it was meeting people that I'd never met before. Um, even, even the, the CFA app at dinner, I, that probably, you know, a quarter of the people there I had never met before. So it was really fun for me um, to, you know, put faces with people that I've been corresponding with online for a long time. So, um, some of them not for a long time, but um, some of them, um, you know, only for a few months, but uh, and then some of them for years. So it was great. I really had a, a big time doing that. Um, and every night there was something, you know, I was doing, you know, between Thursday night, the calf party, Friday night, having the app at dinner, Saturday night, the, the auction and everybody was kind of running around and then going to the bar afterwards. It was just great. It was. I mean, there wasn't a dull moment at all during that show. So. Yeah. Uh, is uh does the appa usually meet at heroes or was that something no special? that was a first that was kind of a, a thing the, the the big meetup for the appa in the past had been in san diego mm -hmm. that's um, what i thought and for several years i mean many years running really uh it petered out about the time i kind of went back to the uh had joined the appa and went back in like 2005 2006 
um, were the last of these. That there was a member who used to have and throw and pay for a party out there, um, which was kind of awesome. And they would bring lots of guests and stuff like that. So it was it was a lot of fun. Um, but there really had not been anything except kind of catch as catch can um, in many years. This was the first time that they'd had an official kind of APA dinner at, at mm -hmm. the show. So it was great. Yeah, well, it was nice. And I, I know that, uh, you know, I was surprised that Joseph Melchior was there. I mean, I, I knew I'd seen ahead of that uh, time he had let people know he was going to be at the show. But you know, it was just fun. There was just a lot of people who traveled to that show that I don't think normally, you know, would do that. Well, and, traveling uh, from London, so that's, that's quite a ways to come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've seen him in um, New York. I've seen him at San Diego before. But uh, Heroes was, it was, was nice as well. So, um, yeah, you know, again, it was just a fantastic opportunity for us all to kind of uh, put – put names to faces and actually meet in person versus being separated by these, uh, these. Plus it's a relatively stuff. small show and so comic focused that it, you know, meant the people who were there were interested in what we were interested in, which was great. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, that, that was just the thing. I mean, we, there was so many people who talked to me, uh, during the show who had, it was their first time going there and who were just really impressed with the focus of the show you know there's no entertainers there's no there's no line for captain kirk at exactly. the, you know, in front of that you have to get past <laughs> through to TV get stars to the and wrestlers and you know whatever else you know uh sort of uh pop culture detritus i mean it was just it's comics comic art and really the way that they do it they focus on artists which is the other piece of it that you know for us obviously is important um you know really literally I, this year more than half the floor area is artist alley mm -hmm. and, you, know, you think about how many shows like are there like that you know there are a lot more artists and art people there than there are comic dealers i mean it, or any kind of i mean it just you know so I, I love that show lots of fun well it was uh it was nice when you got invited into the uh into the group chat on facebook that we were on yeah, i was like exactly. all right now now we've got an elder statesman of the hobby who's been around a long time <laughs> Uh, and it, what's this you know, elder it, statesman stuff? <laughs> well, I and I don't mean that in a negative way. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, you know, that I really appreciated that Steve Nam jumped, you know, because he's an APA member. Um, and really, for me, it's nice because we're bringing in some younger guys into the APA. And at the same time, he, you know, pulled me into this group, um, you know, the, the chat group. And I met a bunch of people um, through that and then met them all in person at the show. So that was that was awesome really enjoyed that um at the the uh saturday afternoon party just you know great great fun so oh yeah I appreciate it to be involved in that so uh so i don't know how many of these interviews you've seen before but we always do kind of start with an origin story and we, you and i were talking a little bit earlier uh as well but uh but you know tell me a little bit about how you got interested in collecting original art you know whether it uh because he seemed to have been an art collector for, or very interested in the arts for a while. Uh, I just don't know when the, when the bug caught you as far as like starting to collect your uh, first few pieces of original art. So, so what was uh, what was the moment like that for you? Well, you know, um, I think probably like some other people, but my dad was a collector, not oh. a collector of this kind of material. He was just a collector. Um, when I was a kid, he had a collector collection of Roman coins with all the emperors, starting with Julius Caesar all the way forward. Um, he had a collection of New Guinea art and artifacts, um, and he also had a print collection that was sort of um, impressionist forward into modern prints. So, you know, there was art around the house and and I was into comics and, you know, started, you know, collecting comics as a kid. Um, not I wouldn't say collecting them per se. I was reading them and. Um, and so I was buying them and, you know, they were just stacked up in a drawer, literally in my room or stacked up in a box, not, you know, they didn't have comic boxes and just boxes and just stuck them in there. Um, you know, no, no bags or anything like that. Just big stacks of comics. Um, and then I guess through an ad in one of the comics, I found the comic buyer's guide. So I got that and I found out about it. And, um, when I was, uh, turning 16, uh, I found out about a show in New York uh, and they were having, um, they were doing a Bernie Wrightson show. And I asked my parents if they would buy me a piece by Bernie Wrightson. So they, they were very skeptical. I mean, it was, uh, it was $150 
And I was what? Well, and my dad was like, $150 for me, a comic car. Well, you know, what is, you know, it's like, dad, look, I'm turning six. I'm not asking you for a car. I just, you know, I, I, I want to get this piece of comic art. Um, so uh, I reached out to them. They, they sent me via mail, like a, a, um, a couple of things. I said, these things are available. Um, and I picked one and, um, and I still have, I mean, it's, you know, it's the first, you know, I, I'd been to a comic show before and I think I'd gotten a sketch, but this was like the piece of comic art. And that was it for a little while. I mean, that was 16. I didn't have any money. Um, what year was this? This was uh, 1975, at the end of 1975. Um, and then, so th they, you know, I, I went, I, I got, you know, a sketch or two, and then I went off to college um, and I was interested. I was looking around and really the next time I bought anything was when I was in college, there was a Barry Smith show in Boston. Um, and I went over there and saw it and I bought what was actually probably the least expensive thing there, um, which I still have and love to this day. I mean, it was just a small piece uh, of an angel that they used for a Christmas card. Um, and then, you know, it, after that, I, when I went to law school um, and I started working during the summers, I was actually making some money. And then I started buying things because I actually had money to spend. So by the mid 80s, I was start, you know, 80, well, early 80s into the mid 80s. That was when I really started buying comic art because um, I had some money in my pocket, not a ton, but enough. Um, and I and I was started to chase it. And I realized that there was cool stuff that I wanted and um, and it was available. So yeah. I, you know, I kind of ran after it. Um, now, were you buying mostly at shows or were you doing it through the comic buyer's guide and yeah I was, you know i was doing what a lot of people did which was you know you, you, i i mean i'm you know in columbus georgia at first and then later you know in the atlanta well athens and then atlanta and you know we would get it you know three or four days after everybody else got it mm -hmm. so you'd be in that situation where you call they oh somebody already got that oh somebody already got that i mean i i can't tell you how many times i was just ran away with disappointment because you know it got mailed to you. And then there were people, you know, who were willing, they were spending the money to get it FedExed or overnighted to them so they could get a, you know, a jump on other people and get the best stuff. And I, you know, I didn't even know that was happening until much later. Um, I thought everybody who, who were, was getting stuff in front of me were probably you in had a fair shot. Wisconsin, you know, that they just got it quickly because it was, it was close, but, uh, but no, you know, you, you could pay the freight, and you could get stuff uh, much easier. Um, and then I'll, I'll tell you one other story from that that early period. And in, in 1976, I was at summer school, and I went to, and I was in Boston, and I went down to New York. Um, and this was I was still in high school actually. And uh, it was the 1976 the bicentennial um, show uh, when they still had the New York Comic Art Show there, you know, and, uh, over the Fourth of July weekend, and I went to the show and I bought several small pieces from Roy Krenkel, uh, which was cool. Like, you know, I got to meet him and buy some stuff from him. And then I saw this amazing um, Neil Adams cover. It was for um, one of the House of Mysteries. It was the one with uh, the, the pan uh, with, with the flute. And he has a mm -hmm. like the statue. I don't know what you're talking about, yeah. His eye. Um, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. Um, and I was staying with a cousin and I was going to borrow a couple of dollars from him and see if I could get it because it was a big 35 bucks for this cut. So, um, I went and this was the 3rd of July. And then I was going to go back after the parade on the 4th of July. And I went to the parade and I got my pocket pick at the parade. No, Every, you know, that was it. Um, so I actually had to borrow that money from him to get the train to go back to Boston because I had nothing. Um, and uh, it was a mess. But and it still look back with regret. And that was I was so close. I had it. You know, I knew I was going to get it. I was going to be able to get the money. And no, that didn't happen. So there you go. That's, You're so that's close. Nice. So close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would that you know I don't have a Neil Adams cover, so that would have been the only one. But well, I was just looking at your calf gallery to see what you might 
if, if it was in there yeah because uh, somebody asked you know about uh, some of the pieces you were just talking about and i do see that the the windsor smith is in your calf gallery yes yes it is um that piece um you know i start i got it when i was ending my uh career as uh, you know my my undergraduate career um i took it with me to law school and then when i started working i you know, I, I you know put up the normal uh, you know crap that you got to put on your your walls, you know your diplomas and stuff like that. But I put that up along with that, and it has hung in my law office since 1984. I've always always had that on my wall um, at my office. So um, I, I look at it as my my angel looking over my shoulder, hopefully uh, keeping me from making any mistakes. But uh, that hasn't worked. But, you know, at least I haven't been bad enough to get me fired. So um, has it been a good conversation piece for any clients walking in? Um, yeah, a lot of people. In fact, um, a woman who works in my office um, who rel you know, relatively new uh, came and was looking at. She goes, God, I, didn't, I never saw that before. That's awesome. And this was two days ago. So. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, eventually some, you know, people will see it or, um, and I've certainly gotten a lot of compliments on it. Um, and I like the fact that a lot of people don't have any idea what it is, or, you know, I mean, they just know that it's a beautiful piece. They don't know any comic, uh, connection. I mean, if you looked at it, you wouldn't think of oh, that as a connection to, you know, the guy who drew Conan mm -hmm. or, you know, or weapon X. I mean, that's not right. Like, scream that to you. Um, so yeah uh and it, it's, it's just beautiful and as a that piece was the least expensive piece in that show um he would he had just published like a portfolio this the sybil portfolio i guess mm -hmm. and it had these beautiful large you know size pieces that were thousands of dollars and i was like yeah that's not gonna happen but this happened and i'm very happy about it so did, uh, i forget did you say you knew the show was there and that's and you traveled there yeah, or he was at a place called the earthlight gallery Mm -hmm. um which was uh downtown and i found out about it and i went there and you know it was interesting I, I there was a lot of um a lot of talk a few years ago about the fact that barry smith made you sign something when you bought from him that basically said if you sold it you had to give him the profit right it wasn't like 10 percent um, of the sale it, or something it was like, like a, you know some percentage of the profit mm -hmm. and i signed that agreement i mean i don't know you know, I don't, you know, rem I don't have it anymore or whatever, but, uh, but I never had to worry about that because it's never going anywhere. So uh, <laughs> nobody, you know, I don't have to worry about anybody, uh, you know, the, the profit from that because uh, it's all going to stick with me. So was he there or, or were you, was, uh, were you no, there at the opening? Or no, he wasn't there. Um, I just, you know, kind of wandered around. It would have been nice if I'd gotten to meet him, um, but I did. I've met him once, but, but only briefly. Yeah, all the all the studio guys were at that show in 1976 um, at the new. So I met him briefly there, but I didn't own that yet. Very cool. Well, and what was the name of the gallery again? It's called the Earthlight Gallery. Um, he did a show with Robert Gould. It was the two of them. It was a, a, a dual show, and there's a poster for it. I don't have it, but there's a poster mm -hmm. for it that's out and about somewhere. Um, but I don't know if they did a bunch of comic shows, but they did that one. And I was, you know, as soon as I found out about it, I was all over it. Right. I mean, I've heard of the, you know, the New York Comic Arts Gallery and they they had done a Barry Windsor Smith show as well. So just from that period. So I'm always curious to uh, see, see if I can research anything related to shows in the 70s, especially when it re relates to any of the people from the, who were in the studio, of course, because that was just such a incredible time. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, and people were, were were taking notice of comics and comics illustrators back then. You know, I think that that was uh, those those guys really brought a focus to uh, to the medium. I mean, certainly Neil Adams was doing it really at the same time as well in comics. But those guys were kind of bringing a, a different kind of a fine art approach to to the medium that uh, hadn't really been seen before. I think and uh, and and they got noticed. And that's when you started. You had a few of those gallery shows with those guys in them. Yeah, they were, you know, and they were they were moving towards doing prints and things like that. It was it was not um, they were moving away from doing stuff that was, you know, the the characters from Marvel or DC, too. They were doing their own thing. They were doing these, you know, there were lots of limited prints and things like that. Um, and it really that definitely was exciting for me um, just to kind of see that kind of material out there. Um, and that's um, that year, let's 77 was the year I graduated from 
high school and I was I went up to New York uh, before um, I, I started school. And that's when I met Mike Kaluta for the first time, which was pretty cool. So very exciting for me. I can tell you that that was a, that was a big thing. Um, and he had a show at a, at a gallery that was on uh, Broadway. I don't think it was the New York comic art gallery, but it was upstairs from a comic shop. Mm -hmm. on Broadway. Um, and uh, yeah, that was one of the first, you know, that, that was probably the third or fourth piece of comic art I ever got. Um, so uh, that was, yeah, definitely a cool thing. Well, you were in the right part of the country to be doing that at that, you know, at that time period. Yeah, I just got lucky. I can, yeah, Columbus, Georgia was not the lucky place to be finding comic art. I can tell you that. There was not a whole lot. Um, but, you know, I worked at a, a, at a used bookstore. So I was, um, I used to ride my bike there and I'd work there in, on Saturday mornings. And, uh, you know, I got paid in comic books, essentially. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I mean, he paid me, but I just bought comics with it. So sure, it of course. The same thing. So, <laughs> Well, hopefully you got a deal on him as well. To see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I got, you know, 15% off or something. So, you know, hey. my so Heather says drink when Benno mentions he's old as dirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, <Bye>. Heather. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Much appreciated. Uh, Oh, there you go. And Ray's, uh, Ray's sent a link to we. I can check out the uh, the poster from the Earthlight. Uh, uh, I'm not surprised that Ray has it. That that seems like the kind of guy who would have that. Yeah, uh, that's a cool that. <laughs> So, um, so uh, in those early days, I mean, were you meeting any of the creators themselves, or pretty much just buying direct from either the galleries or any of the well, mail order? You know, I address? like I said, I was buying mostly through you know trying to buy things through the Comic Buyers Guide. But um, that time when I when I went to that show in New York, um, really that was the first time I ever met a comic artist outside the context of standing across from somebody at a comic show. I'd mm -hmm. been to one in, in I'd been to the Atlanta Fantasy Fair in 1975, and then I went to the big show in New York in 1976, and those were the two shows that I had gone to and you know seen creators. I met you know Chuck Stanley's hand and he signed my book and all that kind of stuff, but. Um, so I went to this gallery in New York and it was really cool. They had all of the art from shadow number three and they oh, wow. had a bunch of, um, of, of Michael's stuff, but it was all too expensive. I mean, I just, I could not buy anything there. Um, you know, every, the cheapest thing was probably a hundred dollars and that was just way outside my budget. So I left and as I was walking down the stairs, Mike Kaluta was walking up the stairs and I was like, Mr. Kaluta, uh, you know, because I was 17, I guess he was probably 27. He was, I think he's 10 years older than me. And um, he said, uh, you know, I said, oh, that show is amazing. He goes, well, did you get anything? I was like, no, I didn't get anything. I didn't have enough money. He goes, well, <laughs> well, how much money do you have? And I was like, uh, $15. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, if you come back tomorrow and bring, bring $15, I'll bring you a drawing. And he did. I went back there the next day. I met, he told me a time and I met him and he gave me a drawing of the shadow for 15 bucks. And it was, you know, like the most awesome thing. And the second thing he did though, which was really cool for me, he gave me his business card that had his phone number and his address on it. Oh boy. So Afterwards, I, you know, I was like, oh, well, he gave me his card. He must think that I should, you know, want me to be able to get in touch with him. So I called him when I was in New York again, you know, over the next like a year later or two years later. And he invited me to come to his place, like over to his apartment. And I, you know, I struck up a friendship with him that is still going today, um, which was pretty amazing. And, and, and really, um, to me, one of those things that makes comic art different from like my father collecting art. My father collected art for years and he never met the people that, mm -hmm. was, you know, he, he just didn't meet those people. Now, later on in life, he did meet some of the modern artists that he had, he was buying from. But, you know, early on, I mean, he just, he didn't meet people like that. And in comics, you did. And you still do, which is to me, one of the great things about the hobby is that it's, you know, those people are not sitting up on Mount Olympus, you know, doing whatever they do. They're, you know, at shows, you can talk to them, you can buy art directly from their hands. 
which is an amazing thing to me. It's still amazing. Well, that's what's special. You know, I, I said that many times to people at the at the show. That that's what I love most about original art collecting is that opportunity to get to get to meet the creators, and uh, you know, having that to, you know, especially buying art directly from them. I mean, that's that's something you just can't get really anywhere else in 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 most types of fandom. But we as art collectors get to experience that a lot, and uh, I think that that's what makes our kind of segment of the hobby just really really unique and and special so and and i wanted to highlight uh, you know rich danny's actually mentioned that uh he said cluedo is a, is a peach that way he did not he did that when i got a sketch from him how much money did you want to spend so yeah, uh, I mean, that was that was a really nice approach right at the end yeah. of the day especially if you knew a fan really wanted to get a piece i mean that was really it's really nice of him to just say you know well what can you afford i'll do it yeah, uh, yeah, I'll do whatever, you know, exactly. And that's how it played out. It's, if, if it was $10, I would have gotten a $10 sketch. If it was $50, I would have gotten a $50 sketch. Uh, but I was at 15. That was my big number. And I, you know, and I still have that sketch. Um, I, you know, I have no, that's not in your calf I, gallery, though, is it? Because I just, it's I was... not. Um, but if you've ever watched Felix's show, um, he actually, that was one of the pieces that I, okay, I I'll go back and look at that. Because, um, because it really was meaningful to me. I mean, it was it was just a cool thing mm -hmm. um, that I was able to get that. So, uh, but I will put it up in my gallery. I'll tell you that. All right. Um, you know, it, it is there, and I will put it up. Um, <laughs> you know, after the show, that might be a good thing. Um, I want so, to thank Chris. Here. Chris Chris made a super chat donation to the channel, uh, thanking yeah. you and I for doing the show tonight. Thank you, Chris. Awesome. What a gentleman. Thank got, you. Yep, we got to meet Chris in person last weekend. Everybody. He's, yeah. uh, he's a lot bigger in person than he looks like on, a, on the TV screen, <laughs> by the way. And I'm six foot, everybody. So everybody kept asking me, uh, you're, or they didn't ask me. They just said, Bill, you're a lot taller in person than I was expecting. I don't know how short they thought I was, Benno, but I got well, the You're always that... sitting down. They only see you sitting down there, you know. <laughs> right. There's... How could they know? <laughs> I get it. Um uh, one, one other thing, AFG mentioned that uh, uh, their conventions were the creation conventions back in the day. And same with me. When I started collecting in the late 70s, uh, Creation Con actually had, came to Cleveland. And so I went to a couple of those when I was getting started collecting comics back in the day. But uh, I don't really remember the artists that went there back then. I remember, uh, I guess I pull up one of the, I actually saved the guides. I, should, I could pull them up and see who was there. But um, I wasn't interested in original art back then, unfortunately. Yeah, that's, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, in this hobby feel that way. They just feel like, you know, that it was there, but they got in kind of late because they just didn't think about it. They were collecting comics. They were focused on comics uh, and not focused on the art. And I have to say, fairly early on, and I think really that was because of my dad, I, I you know, and my parents, they both, you know, had had stuff. Um, they, you know, I, I was interested in the art uh, mm -hmm. I, I, and as soon as I found out that you could actually get it, I, I wanted to get some. That was, you know, no doubt about that. I was I was pretty much on that. Um, so uh, any other uh, creator meets meetups that you had after Kaluta, you know, in those early uh, days of collecting? Not, not for a while. It really, you know, I I met Charles Bess early on because he was mm -hmm. living with Michael. So when I went up there, um, I, I got to meet him. Um, I think that, and that was in the eighties. Um, I have uh, a Spider-Man piece that's uh, I, is in my gallery from Charles Vess. Um, I bought that from his hands standing, you know, he, he had just gotten it back and I happened to be there at the apartment and, and uh, I bought that from, from Charles there. Um, and I, I think at the same time I, I bought maybe a, um, Michael was working on uh, some of the books that he did, uh, the Robert E. Howard books, mm -hmm. uh, all one of those. And I loved that material because it was all um, really sort of um, Middle East kind of stuff. They had all the, these really interesting, uh, intricate uh, kinds of drawings in those books. Um, and I bought a couple of those drawings from him. But the big piece I got was the the cover from Charles. So great. Very, and very as it cool. turns out that uh, you know that black Spider-Man uh, costume has become kind of a big deal lately. <laughs> right. So no, Bess, Bess, I've always loved Vess's work, and he was he was kind of hanging around the guys at the studio during uh, you know that time period. I remember when I was doing the interview with the guy who owned the New York Comic Arts Gallery. He had given me a bunch of photographs from I think Bernie's opening there around '74. And he was like, yeah, there's Charles Vest. There's Charles Vest. Like, so Charles was kind of like a, a part of the scene and sort of, uh, you know, 
I don't know how, uh, I don't really know when he was getting his first published work, but, but it was well, cool to see up, that he was kind he of there and wanting to be a part of that. You know, he was living in Michael's apartment. They, they yep. showed him an apartment. Oh, so I didn't know that. Um, so that was kind of the, you know, um, and that it was, that was a tiny, <laughs> yeah, they were on a, they were on a fifth floor walk up um, wow. on, on West 92nd. Um, and uh, right. Uh, and yeah, it was a long walk up. I, I know Michael was happy, probably very happy when he moved to the apartment, <laughs> Not an elevator because that fifth floor walk up, man, I tell you what, I, I, and even, you know, even now, I think, how do people in New York, how do you do that? I mean, how do you like get your groceries upstairs? I mean, I, you know, it was hard enough to up there by myself with nothing in my hands. Um, but yeah, they, he was on the top floor. Uh, yeah, Ranga says that, uh, Benno, you're never seeing that $2 bill again. <laughs> That's why I put in a dollar ninety nine. Yeah, right? so he gave us a uh, <laughs> Yeah, we'll be talking about those two dollar bills. I hope. That's, uh, yeah, we will. That's, we will. That's definitely one of my little obsessions um, along the way, and and I got some great ones uh, at the show this time. So that was really cool. Except Aranga, he he, you know, stiff. He said he had to do it later. <laughs> yeah, I got to do this one later. He need, he needed a tip somewhere later later that exactly. evening. Exactly. So. Yeah, that he just you know. He just dropped my two dollar bill in your tip jar, and that was that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So, uh, so you know, before, so when, when did you actually start, get involved with uh, the APA? I mean, I, I assume you know been, um, been for a while. So, David Applegate, who I'm, I when I got to uh, Chicago and I was working, I, I was a summer clerk at, at the law firm where he was um, a junior partner, and um, he said. Hey, you know, uh, you know, do you want to go to the show with me? And I did that. And then, you know, I mean, I didn't end up going to work there. I came back and and, and went to work in, in Atlanta. Um, and I wouldn't say we lost touch, but we were not in close touch. And the app was started and I just wasn't, you know, we weren't in close touch. But then I found out about it and I reached out to him um, and he invited me to join. So I joined uh, in probably the early 90s maybe mm -hmm. um issue 37 we're at like issue 115 now um so you know a long time ago because they they were only published three or four times a year so as you can imagine uh between 40 and 115 or 37 and 115 that, that a lot of years have gone by um so i was in it um and then another guy uh, roger hill started it and a, a guy that Roger knew moved to Atlanta and his name's Troy Pierce. And so he, Roger told him he should look me up. And this was probably the Apple. We were probably in the forties, 45, 46. Um, and he moved down here and we met and became friends. And then at issue number 50, the um, Bill Leach who had been doing it said he didn't yeah. want to do it anymore. And they were going to end the Apple. And I got together with Troy and another friend, uh, Dave Newton, and said, hey, I don't want the app to end. This is really cool. Let's see if we can take it over ourselves. So I, the three of us became co-editors. Um, Troy eventually moved away. Dave and I were co-editors. And so I edited the app for 45 issues, probably 10 years. Um, yeah. 10 years, roughly 40 issues. Um, and it was great. I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, I, I will tell you, it taught me to have a thick skin, um, <laughs> you know, and I'm sure, you know, I know and you recruited me. Well, you have, well, you have to have a thick skin too. I mean, people yeah. are interested in telling you what's wrong with what you do you know? <laughs> because they're passionate about it. You sure, know, they're passionate about it themselves. And if you're not doing it, what they think is the right way, they have to tell you that. Um, and I, I, I laugh because I see that happen to you. I, I see people post stuff and I think, really? Come on. <laughs> you know, but, that, you know, All right. sometimes it can be positive criticism, but sometimes it's just criticism, which is annoying. But, you know, I, I just like I said, it, it taught me to have a thick skin about those kinds of things. So I did it for a long time. I met a lot of great people. Um I've corresponded with a lot of great people that I've never met. Um, and, but the thing that it taught me about this hobby, and then I think that you do a great job at and have done it in a sort of supercharged it mm -hmm. is community. 
And the reason I liked the APA was because I liked having a community of people who were into what I was into. And, you know, in the pre-internet age, you know, that was how you create a community. There was only, the only way to do it was to mail, you know, you could call people on the phone, but I didn't know people's phone numbers and stuff. And long distance calls were expensive. Um, so really it helped me create a community of people that I knew who were into what I was into. Mm -hmm. And that to me was invaluable, really. Um, and well, it took a lot of work putting it, pulling that thing together, every issue, uh, shipping oh, them out oh. to everybody. Oh, sometimes sometimes yeah, printing it, a t-shirt yeah. and giving it uh, as part of the, uh, you know, that theme. I mean, it was, it was fun. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, it's a fun, it was a fun thing to do, but yeah, it was a lot of work. Uh, you know, I, I, back then, I mean, now, um, David does it, David Applegate's the editor and, um, he takes everybody's PDFs and he takes the whole thing and they, and they print it all and it's in one bundle and they bind it. He does a lot of editorial work. He does editorial work because that, that, that piece of it is not quite as intense as it used to be. Um, when I was doing it, I mean, a lot of the work I had to do was just putting the damn thing together. <laughs> you had to literally, I would take all the, the copies and I would have to lay them out on a conference room table. And one by one, I'd have to like put the issue together, literally like issue, you know, issue by issue, put it together. And then we'd have to take it to a binder. I mean, it was crazy. Um, but, you know, it was a labor of love. It really, it, it still right, is I mean, it's still a labor of love. It but, was one of the most, uh, you know, the biggest is, like zines that has probably ever been regularly produced for such a long period of time. And, uh, you know, and, you know, Stanley's asking, is it available to read publicly? No, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, these are these when they typically put together a volume of the app uh, based on a topic, they would I think you usually made about what, 15 to 20 extra copies of it. Yeah, it so like. we have uh, they print we print 50 copies. And there are a max of 40 members and they're usually around 35 members. There's, you sure. know, they, but if you're interested in joining, the deal is, is that you have to write. That's the yeah. key to it. You can't join just to read it because there's no app unless people write, obviously. So mm -hmm. you're required to write two pages at least. And, and the interesting thing to me is when I joined, you know, we had 150 page issues. Now, average, I would say 400 pages. So you get a phone book. I mean, in fact, this is our last issue. It's that thick. Um, wow. So, you know, it's it's a big book. Um, and every issue is about like that. Some of them are bigger. Um, when, uh, when I was editor, we were, I actually offered people subsidized printing to get them to write more because I thought it would be cool if, you know, we had bigger issues. Now, in the last year, um, David had to limit people's how long articles could be because we were getting so big that he couldn't put it in a binder. Um, we couldn't bind a whole issue together. It was that much stuff. So it's really, uh, you know, expanded that way. Mm -hmm. um, but, but printing was cheaper. I sure. mean, when you color printing was expensive and, uh, and so now it's, you know, routinely done. Um, why don't we switch to digital and make it available to all? I'll tell you why we don't. Because, well, I, why I didn't want to, and I think that most people have not wanted to, because we like the physicality of it. Um, if you, it, it's like, and I, you know, I hate to poo-poo people who are into it, but it's like the difference between owning original art and getting an NFT. I don't want an NFT. I want original art. I want to be able to frame it, put it on my wall. Um, and essentially the, the deal would be that if we, um, if we did it that way, um, you know, it would be, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be a physical object. The other piece of it was, and this occurred in the last couple of years too, people asked about, well, why don't you take the copies that you have and digitize those and make them available to people? And there's a couple of reasons we haven't done that. One of them is, is that everybody's articles are copyrighted by the person who writes them. We have a lot of members, some of whom have passed away even over the last few years. And, you know, some of whom, I, I mean, I would say we probably don't even know who, where they are. Um, there've been a lot of members over, you know, the, the 30 year, 35 plus years that the app has been around. And we 
can't find them to get their permission. And we can't really reprint their stuff and certainly put it out there without, without, it. without getting their permission. Um, so, you know, we have it. Now, one thing we did do, um, Gary Land was instrumental in saying, hey, we should have a best of. And we put together something that we call the giant size fan thing. Uh, you can imagine where we got that name from. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we did three volumes of that. And it really was sort of a, we picked the best, uh, what we felt like were the best articles from the first 50 issues or so of the APA. Um, and we, and those sold out. There's, I don't, I, I there may be one or two, you know, copies left. Um, some, somebody might have an extra or two. I actually sold the, I think all but the last one or two that I have um, in the last year um, because, you know, we printed it on, we asked people and we figured out how many people wanted them. And then we printed about that many with an extra 15 or 20 copies. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, those things are phone book size. They're, you know, huge. Um, and now um, we are archiving all of the APAs at Columbia University. So as they're printed, um, David, we, we got a full set together. They sent that. And as they're printed, uh, David sends a copy to, to uh, Columbia. And they're mm -hmm. together. So there is an archive where they can all be found uh, if you want to go seek it. But, um, but I don't think, based on what I've heard from members, that we're probably going to go digital. Right. I mean, I, I spoke with David at Heroes and briefly, and he said, he said we'd have a follow up talk about it. But, you know, I kind of expressed that same concern, you know, at some point. I mean, but I felt the same thing as you're saying, Benno. You pretty much have to get the permission from each individual author to ever be able to, you know, digitize and put that work out there. So it's it's not like you'll ever get to see all of it. But, you know, some authors might choose to do it maybe you put a restriction on like you know maybe it doesn't appear digital until a year after it came out or it was published or something well, along those lines. and i think that there's certainly ways to do it and i'm not just i'll you know i'm mean, gonna hate the idea of it um but i would hate the idea of it becoming a digital publication that's yep. not what i want i nope, want i get it. a physical publication uh, at least from my perspective that's what i want um i, I love you know look how many pieces of mail do you get that you're excited to see other than when somebody <laughs> sends you original art or maybe, you know, a book that's, when was that's the last that's that's you art. that you were excited about? <laughs> um, you know, it's nice to get something in the mail. That's not a bill. Um, I, you know, I love that. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a, there's an excitement about it. Um, just, you know, knowing that you're going to get this physical thing, um, you don't know what's going to be in it. You don't know until you get the issue. You have no idea what people are going to write about. Um, the way that we do it is there's a theme, but you don't have to stay on theme. So people write, as long as you're writing about original art, you can write about anything. You can write anything you want. You can stay on theme or not. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it's fun. And I would say that, you know, if you're interested in writing, you should, and you should look into doing it. One of the things that I'm amazed by online you know there are a lot of people who say oh, i don't really want to do it i don't have time and they write reams of stuff online they're constantly writing and writing and writing they're in chat groups and stuff like that i'm like man you write all day you know? <laughs> why do you think you can't write two pages about art all you do is write about art every day you know i mean you're so whatever uh, you know no, I remember, hey i remember it was tough you know i think i was on for maybe seven uh books but it was it, it, you know, I would procrastinate and then turn something in I never felt good about. And that's why I ended up yeah. just dropping out because I knew that I wasn't putting out the same quality most of the other uh, people that were writing for the book was. And uh, and I just it, it was better to have somebody else in there filling my 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 position in the uh, in the chain. That's you know, but it was but because it, it was daunting. I mean, there were some incredible articles written during yeah, that period. There, there are there are people who spend a lot of time. They I mean, do. I, I and. The thing is, there have been times when I spent a ton of time on stuff, and there have been times when I like just got my two pages in because I needed to get something in there. There's no doubt. I mean, <laughs> I, I can't say that every time I'm like, you know, super dedicated and whatever. But, you know, if you're, we're all, in, you know, look, anybody who's watching this, I would think is probably pretty darn interested in this, you mm -hmm. know, and um, I think that it helps 
you clarify your ideas about what you like, why you like it. If you actually have to write things down, it really helps you clarify those things in your own mind. And I find that to be a, a, a great thing. I enjoy thinking about it um, and then having to write it down. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, I think it helps. So, Well, it's uh, it's definitely a very worthwhile publication. They do turn up on eBay every now and again. Uh, I've seen a few oh, sure. out there. But uh, they are hard to come by. That's for sure. I mean, there, there might be one out there on eBay right now. But uh, but yeah, they're, if you can if you can get them, they're definitely worthwhile. And um, you know, I'll talk with David and just get some get his feelings on things. But uh, yeah, if it, if something were to happen from it, of course, I'd be happy to be a part of it. In it, I just can't write anymore. But, uh, <laughs> to preserve the uh, integrity of the of the book, you know, I think is uh, is the main thing. I mean, I know that uh, you know, there's so much effort that goes into those things that. Uh, I mean, it is it is special. I've never seen anything or been a part of any anything quite like it. Yeah, well, it's a fun thing. So I like I said, I'm obviously a big fan. I I edited for ten years. I've stayed in it even after I left the editing, um, and enjoy getting it um, and and reading it and enjoy writing for it still. Um, and you know, like I'm sure that I'll be writing about heroes and mm-hmm. what you know the the weekend we just spent because. To me, that you know, you can really, if it's original art related, you can write about whatever you want to write about, um, and that kind of stuff. It's fun. Um, I don't I mean, think you can write about everything that happened at the bar, though. I don't want to write about it. You know, I'm not going to write about everything, but yeah, a few <laughs> things, <laughs> just a few things. Mm-hmm. Um, well, why don't we start looking at some art? Because I know there's lots of good stories in the, with the pieces that you put together. And you even kind of grouped them, which was, I think, at first. For, in all the interviews I've done, nobody's ever kind of like put them together in, uh, you know, with prelims or interiors or commissions uh, or published pieces. And, I, and that was pretty, pretty interesting. Well, I, you know, I caught pretty widely. So I, I felt like if I was going to show things from my collection, then I should kind of you know, find some themes mm-hmm. of what I do and kind of why I collect, you know, why I've collected things. Sure. Collected. So, and yeah. look, Ray, Ray confirmed. He, he went over to eBay right now. There is one. <laughs> There's one copy of it out there from uh, issue 98 with a, with, a, with a high price tag on it, whatever whatever that might be. But that's that's how it's always been. You usually <laughs> see one. You know, you might see one a month, one every three or four weeks. But uh, yeah. And they, they usually rare. go for well over 100 bucks a pop. Oh yeah, or more. I, mean, I never really see them for under a hundred bucks, and that's mm-hmm. you know, that's that's a good chunk of change. It is. It is very valuable. So, uh, all right. Well, I, these are in the order that you kind of presented them to me too. So, uh, okay. I know the first four pieces are kind of uh, really? part of the same theme. So, I'll go ahead and just show the first image, and we can talk about uh, this one, and uh, we'll talk about the other ones too. Ah, so this is sort of um, a little bit going backwards. Um, I just got this. Uh, right out of Charles Vess's hands uh, last weekend at, at Heroes. Um, this is the summer piece um, from a quartet of pieces uh, that I commissioned. And I've always been a huge Alphonse Luca fan. And um, back in, gosh, uh, the early 90s, uh, I was visiting with a, a guy who was in uh, is in the app with with me, uh, Wally Harrington, and he had this really cool piece by Mike Kaluta um, that was a uh, clearly uh, influenced uh, by Muka. It was a it, it looked like a panel um, from one of the Four Seasons, um, and I reached out to Michael and I said, "I want one like that," um, and he did one, and. Uh, and that was in 1996 that I got it. And after a couple of years, I thought, you know, it would be cool to see if I could get four different artists to do their interpretation and then do each season and have mm-hmm. each artist do a different season. So this is actually the last of the four. Uh, this is summer. Uh, I think it was really kind of cool that it that it bookended between uh, Michael and Charles because they're good friends. And you know, as I told you, they used to live together in New York. Um, and, you know, Charles doesn't really do a lot of commissions. In fact, he probably would tell you he doesn't do commissions. Um, but I think that there was a match here between his interests um, and also the fact that he knew that I'd gotten the first one from Michael. Um, and so, 
uh, I was able to convince him that uh, to do it. And I, it's just spectacular. I think it came out so well. Um, it was kind of cool because, you know, now, I mean, when I got the piece from Michael, you know, it was well, you know, very pre-internet age. Um, but here, uh, before I got it, uh, I got to see him start posting preliminary pieces for it. So I saw the, the pencil drawing. I saw the ink drawing. And then just last week, he, uh, or about 10 days ago, he posted probably about what you see on the right side of your screen here. Um, just a, a clip from it. But the, um, the dress that she's wearing is white. He had not colored that yet. And he actually said, huh, what, what do you guys think I, I should do for uh, the, the color of her dress? And it was, <laughs> there were like 50 responses. <laughs> he was raising from everything. He's like, it looks perfect like it is. Leave it white to, you know, pale yellow or do this or do that. Um, so when I saw it, um, he, I, I said, oh, well, you know, did you like, uh, you know, think about what you wanted to do from, you know, seeing all those responses? He goes, oh, no, no, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I just thought it would be cool to see what other people thought. Right. So he already had in his mind exactly what he was going to do. Um, but, you know, just a, a lovely piece. And um, and I really think it, uh, it especially, you know, with, uh, with Charles, I mean, he has his, the name of his press is Green Man Press. Um, you know, the green of summer. I just think it, it worked perfectly to have him do this piece um, and, and get the, the summer piece, which it just so happened was the last of the four. So it was perfect that it turned out that, um, you know, I got to get Charles to do summer for me. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what's the size on this? Because I, I got to see this at uh, Heroes and I mean, it seemed rather large. I mean, it is pretty large. I would say it is about, I think it's about 30 five by 18 maybe wow yeah i was gonna say about the same yeah that's uh they're definitely three feet long uh, yeah it's super um, impressive and did you have all the i know we're gonna see the other three as well did you ha have like the size and worked out with everybody to kind of keep yes, it consistent? I, did. Yeah. I that was what i did i gave them I, my, the, my my only thing for everybody was i want you know here's the season um this is the size because it had to match up with the size of the one that Michael did um, so that I could frame, you know, I'm not going to frame them all in one frame, but I'm going to frame them in the same type of frame mm -hmm. and hang them together. So I was pretty excited about that. Um, in fact, I thought about um, I, I, the frame that I have in you'll, you'll, the, the picture that I, I sent you, I think um, has the frame for the Mike Kaluta piece. Um, it does. And, you know, I, I mean, I got that frame, you know, 35 years ago. So I know that they do not make that frame. So I'm going to actually have to unframe that. And I love the frame it's in, but I'm going to have to find, you know, frames that all can match. So I'm probably not going to be able to use that frame anymore, which is kind of a bummer because I like that frame a lot. I think it really went well um, for the piece, but, you know, I, I want them to all be in the same frame. So I'm going to have to switch that out. Right, right. Well, let's take a look at the uh, next one here. So this Stelfries. is uh, Brian Stelfreeze. Um, Brian did fall. Um, I, you know, it was easy for me to decide that Brian should do fall because he's famous for liking to do redheads. Um, you know, every year at Heroes Con, he actually, you know, in, typically in, in the past, I don't know if he, he followed through every year, but he asked, you know, his, the people who were on his uh, thread, um, you know, what redhead would they want to see this year? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I reached out to him and said, could you do fall? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, and it's funny that, um, you know, with the purple and the flowers, how that turned out to match up with some of the other, like the, the purple in the dress uh, that Charles Vest did. Um, and so, you know, the, the way things kind of, came together i think it it's really going to be beautiful to hang these together um oh yeah that that summer into fall um so you know and it, it was interesting he went back and forth about how he wanted to do it we talked about it a little bit he um and you'll see michael's coming up later michael used um, a keyhole 
um, as his as design element. And uh, and I think that, um, you know, Brian was kind of playing with, you know, did he want to do a modified keyhole kind of look, which you can see kind of around her head was that idea of like the larger size and that it sort of narrows a little bit. Um, but I love like the, the way that the flowers work and you see that um, the V that they make at the bottom there um, and he's got the leaves falling so you can, you know, it, it's obviously fall. Um, and, it, and really as soon as I, you know, since the, the other thing that I was asking people to do when I did this was I didn't want fully painted. I wanted color pieces, but I didn't want fully painted pieces. The piece that Michael did and, and it, the typically how he works is he does um, ink and then he colors over the inks. So there, there's a line drawing that he colors over. Um, Brian mostly works that way, though he does fully painted stuff. Um, Charles mostly works that way. Um, and the fourth piece um, is also the, that uh, Craig Russell, he works that way as well. So I purposely looked for people who, um, you know, because there are people who I know could do a great job who do fully painted kinds of things, but that wasn't the look I was looking for. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted something that was started as an ink drawing and then went from there. I think Brian probably um, somewhat more so than the other guys, it, it's less obvious that it started with an ink drawing. Um, he really, um, uh, and, but I just love like the, the way he does the skin tones um, and the way they, they change and you can see the light against them. Um, he is really, really interested in color theory. I don't, I'm, I, if you have not ever talked to Brian or watched him work at a show, I absolutely recommend you do that. He is, it is fabulous to watch him work and watch how he builds color and how he uses color theory um, to do the work that he does. No, and he's he, one of the best. Without he, question. It's just, it, it is fascinating. Um, and he is a great teacher. He's very interested in, uh, in teaching people and it watching him do that and watching him do it as he works. Um, I've watched him, you know, explain how he, you know, what he's doing with, you know, line work and things like that, but also, um, you know, how to, uh, how to tell a story and, you know, what he's trying to do and what, how he's doing panel transitions and how he's doing, you know, just all kinds of things. He, he really puts a ton of thought into everything and he loves to talk about what he's thinking and what his process is and why he chose those colors. And, you know, it, it, it's great. It's really a lot of fun to see. Um, and, you know, at Heroes every year, he paints, you know, a, a new piece and really probably near this size. Um, and, you know, just watching him do that uh, is, is. Oh, yeah, amazing. I saw him on stage a few times. Yeah, he, he's amazing. I, and I know my friend Jason is shedding a tear just to see another piece because he was number six on uh, Brian's list. So he ended up not getting a piece from him this, this show. But, uh, you know, that's how it goes, right? In, uh, in getting, you know, pieces from guys at, at shows, especially Brian. I know he's always had short lists when you want to get a, try to get a uh, piece from him. But, um, but those who do get them are very fortunate because those, you know, they're just, they always turn out amazing. Yeah, he does, he does that. But also, you know, and I saw this at Heroes this time, if you brought his book, um, you know, he has a hardcover book of his art. Mm -hmm. He was doing these unbelievably cool remarks not you know and he was taking probably 15 minutes it was almost it reminded me of like when tim sale was doing his 10 minute you know he would and tim would actually take it he, he brought timers he'd flip it over and he'd be like okay i'm starting now and at 10 minutes you know he'd flip it back over and where he was that was where he was but um the uh but but brian i mean he does if you get a black and white he'll he'll do small sketches and drawings even if you're not getting that color piece um, it, it's likely that you can probably get something. So, uh, before we I'm switch over to the next talking. piece, I, I was going to ask you this question as well, because I don't, I, does the, does the CFA APA have actually an actual website? Like if somebody wanted to apply or get more information, because I, yeah. I, I was Googling it while we were talking about it. And really the only thing that comes up is the Wikipedia page. Yeah, there used to be, but there isn't anymore. Uh, to my, See, well, that's at least, hey, if I help you guys with anything, and maybe it's just to get 
some kind of a presence out there so that people are a little bit I more. I think that would be a great idea. And okay. I think that people would be willing to put some of their articles. I mean, I'd certainly put articles up. I don't know if anybody wants to read the crap I write, but they, you know, <laughs> but I'd put something up. Um, I'd say, you know, my best articles have usually been uh, interviews because mm -hmm. you know, it's fun. I, I enjoy that a lot, interviewing people and, you know, like you're doing. I mean, it's fun. Uh, you it can is. learn a lot and it's interesting. Um, and interviewing creators, I mean, like the, like you're doing, I mean, that's the most fun of all. <laughs> it is. <laughs> like, it really is. That's what I have my most fun. I'm having fun right now, Beto, don't get me wrong. But yeah, I always say that I, I like talking with creators because it, it's just different. You know, it's that you're talking to the source at that point. And, uh, but that's, again, that's the fun part of the hobby. Even if you get only five minutes in front of them at a table at a show, I mean, you know, you always walk away with, with, Typically, we typically walk away with great memories. Those of you, I saw somebody talking about commissioning people or somebody at uh, Heroes and they, you know, you paid and you didn't get it yet. That those things happen too. So maybe those aren't the best experiences. But, um, but yeah, I, I love chatting with with uh, creators. I, I only spent like a minute talking with Ron Friends, and he had me laughing the whole time I was there. You know, just he was just ribbing his rep next to him, and uh, just just it was just a really enjoyable experience getting to hang out with him for a few minutes. Yeah, I, there's nothing like it. I said, it really is. And, you know, it's uh, the, the ability to meet people um, that create the art you love and then sometimes watch them create it in front of you is, you know, is a really incredible thing. I mean, I, you know, some guys like to do convention sketches. I mean, there are definitely people who just don't like to do it at all. Either they're going to bring pre made stuff because, you know, and, and I can understand that. I, don't, I mean, when I'm at work, I really don't want somebody to stand over me while I'm working. That's that's kind of a I don't like that. <laughs> well, you know, but it's an amazing thing to me that a lot of these are. I mean, they do a ton of this and they don't mind and they and they're able to just sit there and spontaneously create things with a crowd of people standing around them. Uh, I I can't imagine you know that kind of you know I mean it puts you under so much pressure. You know what are you going to come up with? And everybody wants you to come up with the great piece for them. Um, and you don't know, have to start from scratch and, and do that. So it's a lot of pressure when you're trying to enjoy your weekend, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I, I think uh, the, the guys, you know, the guys who sketch at shows, they're working until the end of the show and then mm -hmm. they go out and having fun, but the show itself, they're working and sometimes really hard. Queer. Very true. Very, very true. So uh, let's see, we got two more from that, uh, from your set here. This one's, I mean, this is a stunning piece, it really. Yeah, is. So this is uh, Craig Russell. Um, you know, he uh, the, he did a, um, a Kickstarter and um, he was, you know, asking, you know, there was, a, you know, things that he was doing for his Kickstarter. And I think there were, you know, black and white pieces were this. And, that. and I actually just reached out to his rep um, and I and I said, hey, I. I I understand that, you know, he has this and this, but can I ask Craig if he'll do something different than just, you know, um, a Sandman piece or something, you know, I mean, look, he's done a bunch of characters that he's very famous for, you know, he's done a lot of work for Elric with Elric and a lot of yeah. um, main things, but, you know, I knew that I wanted him to be one of the guys to do this. So I asked him um, if he would do winter. And uh, he just, you know, knocked that out of the park. It's <laughs> when I saw it, I was amazed. Um, and obviously he liked it enough because it turned out that he used it um, in later campaigns as uh, one of the um, one of the things you could get was a print of this piece. Um, so and when Craig sent it to me, he actually sent me the black and white piece before he colored it. So I have uh, a thing that most people don't get to see, which is the black and white of this. And then he sent me the color print along with it. So. Um, yeah, I I can't tell you how excited I am about the opportunity to to uh, put this uh, put these four pieces together in frames and hang them together. I think it's going to be pretty spectacular to see them all together. Um, it was a little disappointing, and and actually uh, Charles Bass said to me, "Because wait, well, you didn't bring the fourth piece." I was like, "Well, it's in a frame." <laughs> it was just you know I. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the guys who drove up there with me will say our car was packed to the gills. And I had I actually rented a car because my car was not big enough to get all our stuff in there between the art that we were bringing up and all of our suitcases and stuff. Um, we barely got it into an oversized SUV. So, um, yeah, that there was no room for that for that last piece. But um, 
you know, it, this one, uh, you know, I, I was just amazed when it showed up. I, I, I couldn't believe it. And I, this one, um, I didn't see before. I was going to ask you that. This one was one the the, well, I mean, the only one I saw before or saw really much of before I got it, um, was the piece Charles did because it was, you know, he started posting stuff on it, but this one didn't see it till I opened the back package up. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, blew me away. <laughs> um, same thing with the one that Brian sent me. I didn't see anything until I, in uh, no black and white, no prelim, no nothing until it showed up, um, you know, in the package. So that was, uh, yeah, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. So a kind of question fitting that theme before we uh, go to the last piece from Johnny, where he, he said, you seem to have a good eye for art. How do you handle receiving commissions that you don't find appealing or does that not happen often? I mean, clearly it didn't happen in those two instances. They were probably, your jaw was probably on the on the table when you were looking at them, but a uh, good question from Johnny here. Um, I, I mostly keep my mouth shut and put it in a portfolio. Um, I, and it's, it's absolutely has happened. I mean, you can't, you know, to some degree, it's a crapshoot. Um, it's um, when it's an expensive crapshoot, that's a bummer. Um, I I haven't really spent like big money. I'm a cheap guy anyway, but I, <laughs> I, I think you're supposed spent, to drink when you say you're cheap. I think, <laughs> um, but I but I I haven't um, I haven't gotten anything that was thousands of dollars that I was just like, oh god, mm -hmm. not very much. Um, but I certainly have gotten things that I thought were less than what I thought they would be. And, you know, I, I think that's going to happen. I mean, in fact, I've gotten things that I didn't like as much as I thought I would from people that I'd gotten stuff that I loved. You know, not not like a creator I'd never worked with before. There are creators that I've done stuff with before, or gotten things from before that I loved. And I thought, oh, I'll get one more thing. And it was like, oh, man, that's kind of not so great. Um but you know, I think that's part of the game. And if you're if you want to do commissions, you have to be willing to handle the disappointment of getting something that isn't exactly what you wanted. Yeah. If you don't want to have that possibility, then buy stuff that's already created. You know exactly what you're getting, um, and you know, but you lose that element of surprise, of you know, of amazement. Um, I can, you know, I mean, and. Uh, you know, I would say 85% of the time, that's what happens. I mean, there's certainly a, you know, 10 or 15% chance that it's not going to be what you wanted. Um, but I've been lucky, I think. And maybe maybe I've been lucky. Um, I think maybe also that I look at the work that that person has done, commission work that that person has done before, um, to see the kind of quality of commissions that they do. Because... You know, commissions are definitely a different game than buying published art. Right. They and really are. Not everybody does it. Not everybody does it the same way. Um, some people, you know, it is and you know, and you have to think about a couple of different things. You have to think about how long it will take to get it. Some people are not very quick. You have to decide, you know, how much am I going to put up with in terms of waiting for things? Um, I, you know, I can tell you at least one of these pieces I waited many years to get. Um, and it was frustrating, but I got something awesome at the end of the day. You know, there was definitely a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, which was cool. Um, but that isn't always what's going to happen. And mm -hmm. there's no doubt about that. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, I, I don't really go back and say, hey, there's a problem here. Right? I, I haven't really done that. Um, I, I think I expressed a little disappointment once. And it was that it was disheartening for me. And I think it was disheartening for the person who had created it. And then I realized that that was, you know, it, I, he wasn't going to do a new piece for me. I wasn't going to ask him to do that. So, right. why, you know, why go down that road? I mean, I wouldn't, you know, there was no benefit to him. I wasn't going to, I didn't feel any better. And, and I knew they did and they, and you know, why are you going to make somebody else feel bad? And you're not going to feel any better and you're not going to get anything better. So it's not, I mean, what's the point? Uh, so I, I learned my lesson, I would say. Um, and now if it's not exactly what I want, I, you know, lick my wounds and go on to the next thing. If I, you know, exactly. Well, that's, that's best. Sometimes it's better to just keep your mouth shut and 
and that's it, right? I mean, yeah. I've I've had a few pieces that I've commissioned early on. I, I I don't do a lot of commissions anymore, and probably that was part of it. I I ended up not liking the risk. I, I liked being able to buy something that was pre-done uh, and not uh, not gamble on a commission. And con sketch, I, you know, I would I'll do that at shows certainly, but yeah. I'm not expecting a whole lot from those. I you know, and I kind of know what I'm going to get something a little bit more spontaneous and polished you know you know what you're going to get from bob mcleod for instance or, but you know you may not know what you're going to get from somebody you're a little less familiar with so yeah but how uh, do you feel all right so that that game has changed too when mm -hmm. i was younger you know when you got a con sketch you know, it was 20 bucks 25 bucks 50 bucks you know 75 maybe 100 if it was like you know wow but now you know people are i mean 100 is sort of the minimum you know, 50, let's say, is the yeah, there, there aren't many at 100 50, anymore. 100, it's more like 150 for a head sketch, yeah. 250 and, and I, for a bust, 500 if you wanted a, a full figure on 11 by 17 with no background. Exactly. I mean, it, and, I, and that's that's that's, that's me, where it's at these days, right? I'm not, I, I'd rather go buy a commission and say I'm going to spend a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars than I am to spend four hundred dollars for something I know they're going to do at a show. And, you know, I, and look, I've gotten some great things at shows before, but I'm more apt to say I want to do a pre-done thing that you could bring to the show than I would to get something at a show. Though I've gotten yeah. a few things at shows and certainly, like I said, I've gotten some things I liked quite a bit, but I'm less in that game right now because it's got it's expensive and the risk reward ratio for a PC you're spending three, four hundred dollars is not to me that's not very good anymore it, it was a lot better when it was 25 or 50 bucks you know i, I didn't feel like oh my God, i just spent 400 dollars and i don't you know, and you know and and you know they're gonna have to do it in 30 to 45 minutes because they got a long list um so i'm less inclined to buy convention sketches um than i am to buy commission work mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, 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 when you talk about risk, I think that risk reward ratio is not so great. Uh, well, here, why don't we take a look at that fourth piece, the framed piece out of all of them? Let's see here. Uh, here we go. So this was the original piece that I got, um, and uh, like I said, I got it back in '96. Um, it's interesting. It's it's very close to the piece that Wally Harrington got. Um, I won't say exactly the same, but it's pretty darn close. Um, and I think Wally would say that I, I got the better one too. Um, um, it, it just, uh, I, I think he looked at the idea and refined it some to, to create this piece. Um, and this piece, uh, you know, it hung in the hallway outside my daughter's room for most of her childhood. I mean, almost all of her childhood. She was born in 92. So, by, you know, by the time she, you know, I got it in 96. So by the time she remembers anything, it was there in the hallway outside the room. Um, and, uh, you know, I loved it. I mean, look, I loved it enough so that I thought, wow, I'm going to kick off a, you know, a 30 year quest to get, you know, three more images to, to match with it. That's how much I loved it. And mm -hmm. I, I still do. Um, it, yeah, I, I agree, Ray. It is similar to the Paris covers. Um, you know, but Michael has an aesthetic um, and then is very close to that kind of Mooka. I mean, he, of the people that I got something like this from, um, I think Michael's probably closest to that direct aesthetic of, of Alphonse Mooka. I think, you know, he really has studied his work and, um, and are, you know, I knew when I, you know, having seen the one that Wally had, I knew when I um, asked him to do it that, you know, it was going to be very much in that mold. And I think if you look at Amuka, you'd see, um, you know, it, it is very much in that mold. Um, now, he did not do this as a spring piece. I decided, looking at it, that it most closely, you know, matched up with a, a spring idea. Um, and so I said, okay, this is spring and I'm going to do the other ones from, but you know, he didn't call it spring or anything like that. It was just a piece that was supposed to be, you know, inspired by Muka. Um, and I decided that, um, I could, you know, do something like that. Now, you know, the, 
actually even having gotten the fourth piece from Charles, I was like, gosh, I wonder if I should now do the times of the day. And, you know, I mean, cause Muka did various things and they That's were all in quartets. Um, he did ones that were um, like the, like dance and music and uh, painting and something else, you know, the, like the uh, different kinds of, of arts, like lively arts or whatever. Um, so he's done different kinds of things. Um, but I probably won't. I think that, you know, uh, I don't think I can live long enough to get another four of these. <laughs> now, when you commissioned the the uh, final three artists, did you show them this as an example of, uh, you know, kind of what you were looking for? Or did you? Yes, I did. They also. Mm -hmm. Yep. That was, um, yeah. I mean, you know, it was the springboard for it. I said, this is kind of, you know, because um, also they, they had to, you know, they this is the dimensions and this is kind of, what I'm thinking about. Um, and yeah, Jeff, I do think it's, it's really well framed, but like I said, I'm really kind of like, Oh, I'm going to have to like find another frame. I'm sure I can find something similar to it. Um, but it's, you know, I won't be able to find something exact. And, you know, had I known that I was going to be doing this, I would have, I think uh, you're going to have to do a fifth commission. Frames. I know you'll, you'll have to make a fifth commission of something completely different that will exactly. fit this frame because you have to keep using it you can't just throw it you know toss it to the side and never use it again so yeah i can't imagine that i would get rid of the frame it is it is a beautiful frame it so really I'll is do something with it um yeah so yeah this piece so this was yeah probably the first um it was probably the first like major commission i ever got to i mean mm -hmm. i just didn't you know i, I have to say I, I was at Wong's house. I saw it and I thought, I've got to, I, I mean, literally the next week I called Michael. I was like, I've got to get something like this. this is awesome. Um, you know, and, and I was just inspired by it. It was, it was beautiful. So, uh, and I'm inspired by the one that I got. So it's, it's a great thing. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, so we're moving into some strip art now. And uh, I think you have three examples from the, from that section. Okay. Sure that I picked I picked my favorite to go first though. Oh man, um, <laughs> it's interesting. People, uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, what's your favorite piece in your collection, or you know, what's the, what was the piece that you wanted the most, or whatever. And most people assume I'm going to say that the the Miller Dark Knight piece. It's certainly the most valuable piece I have. But man, I this was one I read Prince Valiant in the paper when I was a kid. It, it was actually published in the Columbus paper. Not published in the Atlanta paper, but published in the Columbus paper. Um, and I loved it. And I had the Nostalgia Press, the two hardcovers with the uh, the first like four or five years of, of Prince Valiant in it. And I was just obsessed with it. And um, when, and, you know, strip art on a relative basis was so much more expensive than comic book art. Um, this piece when I got it um, and I got it the same year as I got the dark Knight piece. And this was 50% uh, more expensive. And the only reason I was able to afford it was because it was um, significantly darkened. It had browned a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to get it for a reasonable price. And I actually, when I got it home, I, I took it, I didn't know any people who did re restoration. So I took it to the High Museum of Art, which is the, the museum here. And I asked someone there, you know, who they had that was a paper conservator. And they gave me this guy's name. And, and I took it to the guy that the High Museum used for their paper conservation. Um, and he, um, I, I, they call it light bleaching. I mean, he, they, he uses a, a light process to, uh, to and, and deacidified it. And it's still tan I and mean, it's not white, white, like some of um, the, the pieces that you see by Foster. Um, but man, as soon as I saw it, I knew it was the one for me. It had, you know, it had the Native Americans in the scene. It has Valiant. It has a fight. It has Alita. It has a Viking. I was just like, man, this has everything I want. It has that billowing cloud behind the, the, the boat, you know, with the sail. I just, you know, it, it still, it, it is um, one of the first things you see when you come in my house. Um, and I am, I frame a lot of my art and I, and because I do that, I have to move things around a fair bit. Mm -hmm. One never moves. 
it's always in the same place it you know it is the it, it is one of the it's like a pole star it you know it it is the 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 thing that i have on the wall and just and it's you know it's just beautiful um and i can i never tire of looking at it um it it really is an amazing thing um but you know comic strip art um is probably i don't know 40 percent 30 35 40 percent of of my collection i mean i love comic strip art um always have uh collected it fairly early on i mean it wasn't the first thing i got but it was you know early on i was focused on trying to get it it was just very expensive um you know always but you know sort of and and really the you know now on a relative basis it's inexpensive um except for the very you know except for george harriman you know hal foster alex raymond um which are expensive things but even that you know on a relative basis when you think about like the best foster or the best raymond is you know which i would have thought it would stand with the best of any comic art you know i don't think you're going to see a three million dollar hal foster or a three million dollar alex raymond um because and, and you know i don't know i don't know what comic strip art you would find that could hit the numbers that comic book art are, is getting now I just, right i don't know that that can happen and i certainly don't think it's a question of the quality of the work um i, I it, it's clearly you know character driven but um but yeah i just you know love this piece um it's nice it's nice that it's framed um one of the things that um I, I laugh about I about I don't know ten years ago. Um, SCAD uh, asked me if I would help them put together a show down in Savannah. They were they Mark Schultz was down there teaching, and they were doing um, a symposium for artists, and they wanted to show. Uh, they called it a hundred years of comic art, um, and they asked me and they asked Scott Eater um, if we would help put something together, which. Um, we did, and they tried to get something from every decade, from 1900 through the end of the century. So a century of comic art. Um, and they asked me, uh, and they were like, oh, this is great. You know, um, what we'll do is we're going to fly you down to Savannah from Atlanta, which, uh, you know, and put you up in a hotel. And, and I said, look, you know, I don't really want you to fly me from Atlanta to Savannah. And I don't need to stay in a hotel because I got a friend who lives in Savannah that I was going to stay with anyway. How about you let me keep the frames after you frame this stuff? <laughs> and that, Not a bad deal. Oh, it was a great deal. Instead of getting, you know, a two hundred dollar flight and a hundred and fifty dollar room in Savannah, I got about two thousand dollars worth of framing. You know, ten years ago, it was you know, including a piece, you know, a big piece like this, this valiant, perfect deal for me. Um, you know, I was very excited that they agreed to do it. And they were ha happy to do it because they have a framing department down there. Um, so, you know, for them, it was an easy thing. And for me, it was an easy thing. So um, everybody was happy. Well, that worked out well. I mean, there's yeah. uh, there's something to be said for kind of wheeling and dealing with those sorts of uh Yeah, well, I mean, just, there's no value to me in getting a, a yeah. flight to Savannah. I mean, it's, you know, I can drive down there in a few hours. And, um, you know, Scott had a bit of a longer drive, so... Yeah, he exactly. I mean, you know, if I, if I was coming from New York or somewhere, I absolutely say, like, okay, great. Thank you for doing that. But um, it just so happened this this worked out well for me. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what? I put some stuff in a show recently and they said, no, we won't do that. And I was like, and they, I mean, I mean, that they just couldn't do it. So I was like, okay, well, you know, I thought it, would, it, it worked once. It did not work twice. Can't always get well, it. Well, you've done work for them before, though, with, with SCAD, right? I mean, yeah. So maybe, yeah. You know, I love, you know, those, they, they've been very, very nice. Um, the, uh, I work with John Lowe down in, um, down in Savannah, but also um, up here, uh, Pat Quinn runs the program in Atlanta. And uh, I have, uh, I've gone there and, and done a class, done a guest lecture for those guys. As you can see, I like to talk, so that, that works out pretty well. <laughs> um, and uh, so, uh, you know, when I, I've taught a guest class. Um, uh, for probably the last five, six, seven years, um, once a once a year, um, and I bring art, and it, it's fun. I have a great time doing it. Um, and when we were at Heroes, a woman 
came up to me spontaneously and said, I know you, you taught at SCAD one time. I remember your collection. That was like awesome. That is cool. very happy, you know, and it was several years ago. So that made me feel pretty good. That was a good thing. Um, Let's see here. You had, you had mentioned Harriman. So why don't we uh, take a look at this? So, um, you know, obviously George Harriman, crazy cat. Um, I had a crazy cat. Um, I actually got it in a trade uh, for another piece by Miller, another Dark Knight piece. Um, and I had it for several years. Um, and I liked it, but I just, I didn't love it. I didn't love the gag. I think that a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of the crazy cats, you know, the gag is inscrutable. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's not about just like, you know, laugh out loud humor kind of stuff. Um, but a friend um, who passed away last year, Bob Murphy, um, had this piece and I worked out a deal and I traded him for this piece. I gave, he got my crazy cat. I gave him another piece to get this one because, um, I just thought it was funny. It's about having a cocktail, which I thought was, a, you know, I've had mm -hmm. to enjoy a cocktail or two in my day. Um, and I just thought it was a funny gag and it has all three characters, which is what I wanted. It doesn't have a brick, but to me that, is not as critical as it is to some people. I wanted a funny gag. I wanted all three characters and I got exactly what I wanted on this one. So I'm super happy to have made that trade. Um, and you know, it's, it's a classic strip for a reason. I mean, it's beautifully drawn. Um, I love the way that, um, he changes the backgrounds. <laughs> I mean, you can have the same, he, you can be looking at him like the characters from the same angle and everything. And the backgrounds just completely change in each in each panel. It, it, I just love that. It's you know it's very um, you know definitely one of those things where you think about it's surreal. Um, that's the you know um, almost like a, a like a Windsor McKay. Um, mm. That kind of you know just wow, there's something crazy going on here. You know, it's just super inventive, um, and uh, it doesn't just follow logic, uh, which I like. So. Yeah. Well, sure. I've never I've never owned a Harriman myself, but if I had this one, I would be pretty satisfied without needing to get another one. This this is a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. It's fun. And that's what I liked about it. It was, you know, they said that it had a gag and it had all the, the elements that I wanted. So it is definitely a, a good one. And, you know, uh, as soon as I got it, got it in the frame, got it on the wall. Um, and it's one of those ones that, you know, I move it around some, but it's, you know, but it's almost always on the wall. That's beautiful. And, uh, you, you know, so, be complete without a Schultz piece. Yeah. So this one's got a story behind it. You know, I, I, like most people who have collected comic strip art, um, you know, I, I thought I could get a peanuts, you know, I always thought I could get a peanuts until, um, Charles Schultz got sick and, and retired from the strip. I mean, you could, you could just buy peanut strips. I mean, the 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 um, museum out in uh, California, you know, regularly sold to raise money. They just they had catalogs of peanut strips, um, and certainly you know early collectors. You wrote him a letter, and he he sent dozens, hundreds of strips out to to collectors along the way. Um, so, but I, but I missed that train. I, you know, I was dumb. I just, I didn't do it. Um, I, you know, like a lot of people, a lot of things, I thought they'd always be available and they'd always be available at a price I could afford. And that turned out to not be true. Um, but about, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago, um, we, I, I, I help at Dragon Con every year. I help uh, put together a, uh, an original art show. Um, and we do it with a group of collectors um, that's changed over the years. But, you know, with four of us, we put together a show. And um, a few years ago on the centennial of uh, the birth of Jack Kirby and Will Eisner, which was the same year, which was kind of cool, um, we, um, we decided we were going to do a, a, a joint show of Eisner and of Kirby. And... Mm -hmm. The four guys that we, uh, the, between the four of us, we had a bunch of Kirby's. There were only three pieces by Eisner. And so I was looking and I called Tom Heinches, who lives here in town and publishes Hogan's Alley, uh, knowing that he had worked with Eisner and he might know somebody who had an Eisner. 
And he told me he did. He said he had a friend, but unfortunately his friend had passed away. But he thought that his friend's um, stepson had gotten his art. Um, and he would reach out to him and see if he had an Iser, and, and, and he did. And the guy said yes, and he would be willing to put it in. So that was great. And, and he lived near, he actually didn't live super near me, but he worked near me, uh, near where I live. So um, a friend of mine and I went over to get it. He was, he's a sous chef at a very, very good restaurant here in Atlanta. And so we showed up, I got the page, I thought it was really cool. Um, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm walking out in the parking lot with my friend. And I said, man, that guy had an Eisner. I wonder what else his stepfather had. And literally, just as I finished saying that, I hear, hey, hey. And I turn around and the guy is standing there and he goes, you know, I've got all this art that was my stepdad's and it's sitting in the basement of my house and like, you know, in a portfolio and I don't have anything to do with it. Would you be one? You think you might want to buy it? I was like, "Woo, yeah, I think I might. that might that might be just great." Um, and so he sent me a photo, and literally it was just like a a bunch of art that he kind of pulled out of the portfolio and just kind of threw it on a table and took a picture, not like each thing separately. And the last two panels of this uh, peanuts were sticking out, and I said. Oh, because <laughs> it was clear that not only was it a peanuts, it was an early peanuts because you could see that, you know, this is before Lucy. I mean, really, the, the look changed over time. This is a very early look, um, early look for, for Charlie Brown, early look for Lucy. Um, and so I bought the collection from him. Uh, and otherwise i never could have gotten the peanuts i mean i just they were outside my range of what i'm willing to pay for things but i bought a bunch of art from him i sold uh, you know probably 20 percent of it through heritage to so that i could afford to buy the rest of it um and some pieces that i really loved i can tell you some things that i did not want to sell but i just i had to to, to be able to get this one and this was sort of the whale in that collection um it just it's a great piece um, interesting, you know, I, I never met the guy who, who put the collection together. Um, he was into, um, which I wouldn't say every piece, but, um, he was into gunplay. Hmm. Um, oh, so that's why he, he had this piece. Yeah. He looked, yeah. He looked for pieces that had guns in them. Um, and there were several pieces like that. Uh, and, you know, strip art and just a few, mostly strip art, but a few comic pieces. Um. But, you know, that's not my thing. Um, and obviously, it's just a toy gun. But I just thought, wow, you know, it's a great piece. I mean, it's really, uh, really fun, cool gag, super early. Um, and, you know, and very, very lucky uh, that I got to get it totally unrelated to looking for peanuts. It just happened to be in, you know, this guy's collection. So I got lucky. Right. There's uh, there are many types of collectors out there, aren't there? You know, that uh, focus on particular artists or titles, yeah. themes. I mean, themes. I, mean, it's, uh, but I would have thought gunplay would not have been a theme. I would have thought. I haven't heard that before. No. <laughs> it was just, but that was this guy's theme. So, you know. Well, yeah. Um, no, well, you lucked out at the end of the I day. I did. I looked. Flat out lucked out. Yeah. No two ways about it. Just, um, you know, and I knew it. When it happened, I knew it. Um, I was like, wow, okay, this is, you know, this is crazy that this guy happened to have these pieces. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, he had, th there were some interesting things in there that I, that I sold. There was a, um, probably had four uh, pages, that sort of thing. Stuff, so. yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, okay. Moving on. This is a, that was the end of the strip section of this uh, presentation tonight. So we've got some, I've got a couple of prelims here that we're going to go over to now. Let's see. We sh and we showed one earlier, right, with the Barry Windsor Smith, but yeah, no. Well, that's that that Windsor Smith was not a preliminary. That actually, oh, okay, was the final piece. They, I, I don't know how they did it, but they took that piece and um, they darkened the the lines and they uh -huh. made it, it, was a, it was a Christmas card. I have the card. Oh, oh that's what you did say that. I was when I kind yeah, of got off track when you were talking about the other pieces that were the main pieces of the show, the ones that you couldn't afford, and I just yeah. I kind of just switched over and thought it must have been a a prelim for that but uh so tell me about this piece here so um 
George is Gen D, uh, lives in Atlanta. Um, I have, uh, I'm lucky to have several pieces of his in my collection. Um, and the piece that I have from this pair is the piece on the left. Um, that was uh, um, sort of a, a, a manga Vampirella uh, series that he did some covers for. Actually, Cully Hamner did some. So a couple of the guys in Atlanta uh, who were in Gajim Studios uh, ended up doing pieces for that. Um, and, you know, I, George was working at, at Gajim Studios or working out of Gajim Studios. Um, and I went and got the piece and I saw the preliminary and asked him if I could get the preliminary with it. Uh, which he graciously let me do. Um, but I bought, I don't know, a half a dozen preliminaries from George's um, at that time. And I always loved preliminary art. It is a major part of my collection. I would say 25, you know, I talked about maybe 30% of my collection was, was mm -hmm. comic strip art. Probably 30%, of, maybe 40% of it is uh, preliminary art. I have a ton of preliminary. Um, I've always loved it. I love seeing that initial creative process, the, the first idea. You, and it's amazing to me how often um, there's more life um, in that drawing than there is in the final piece. Um, and here, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if the final piece is in my calf. If, if it's not, I'll, I'll put that up too. Um, but you know, it was, you know, I talked to him about it. I mean, he was, um, you know, it, it was just, it was neat to be able to get that. And, and I think um, it's particularly special for me to get preliminary art when I have the final piece, but I have a ton of preliminary art that I don't have the final piece and probably will never even see the final piece um, because I just like it. I, ju I just enjoy um, seeing that creative process, kind of seeing, um, you know, you can really see pencil to paper there. You can see the lines that aren't don't end up in the final piece. A lot of times you can see the perspective. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is, I think, a pretty good example of the kinds of things that I'm looking for um, and continue to look for um, from artists that I talk to. Um, and I would say when I buy commissions, um, I always ask if I can get the preliminary. Sometimes I can't. Um, in the last, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I, I bought a piece from Tony Harris um, and I was going to get the preliminary from him and I saw him at Heroes. He said, yeah, I realized I just, I can't do it. Um, and I said, oh, well, why not? He goes, it's, it's in a book. Uh, you know, I have, a, I have a sketchbook that I keep and I put the preliminary there and I'm just not going to cut it out of the book. Then I, don't sure. know that. I told you I would, but I decided I just can't. So I got a different preliminary from him at the show. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, sometimes they're just not available. Um, I would say Craig Russell does the same thing. You know, I would love to have gotten the preliminary for the piece that I got from him, but he, he does those and does most of his preliminary work in a sketchbook. Um, so you just, you can't get it. Um, now on the other hand, you know, you see sketchbooks that people have, um, I think famously, um, Adam Hughes sold a couple of the sketchbooks. Um, and I will tell you, it was very unhappy when um, they were cut up and, and sold as individual pages because he sold it as a sketchbook and and assumed that the person who bought it was going to you know, keep it together and they didn't. And he was not happy about that. Um, oh, I do remember that. I mean, I know somebody who has one of his sketchbooks that didn't cut it up still. So they, they are out there, but you're right. I do remember that. And that was... Uh, but that was a long time ago, wasn't it, Beno? That was, oh, yeah. This was like probably 15 years ago, 10, yeah, 15 years ago. Five, somewhere around in yeah, there. It was, uh, but, you know, and and I think that um, I don't think he would do that again. I don't think he would sell a sketchbook again just because he, that happened. And now he doesn't want to do that. Now, he, you know, you can get preliminary work from him, but I don't think he would sell another sketchbook in full. Sure. It, it, unless he broke it up, he wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and some people won't do that. Um, but, you know, I've seen sketch, I mean, th there was, um, I talked to a guy about a Frazetta sketchbook, um, and those were famously cut up. I mean, those, mm -hmm. those came in a book. Um, they were, you know, th they were like, uh, looked like, um, you know, the kind of books that you take tests in at, at school, you know, they have a cover and whatever. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I saw one, the, the, most of the Lord of the Rings prelims are, 
or in a sketchbook that was sold probably I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, but, uh, you know, and I talked to the guy and I was like, oh, can I buy like one piece? And he goes, well, you know, I didn't want to do that. And I didn't end up buying one from him, but um, he didn't really want to break it up. And then he said to me, well, you know, then I looked at it and I realized, you know, you can see where, you know, a bunch of pieces had already been cut out of that book. Um, sure. but, you know, before he got it, somebody had cut pages out of it um, because that's, you know, I mean, look, in, in a lot of ways, you know, it's much more valuable to piecemeal things like that. You can, you know, um, so you can get them, you know, uh, less expensive or more, um, more cheaply. Um, but, you know, the preliminary work, I, I mean, I, I'm all over the board on that. I've got large size preliminaries. I've got smaller ones. I've got thumbnails. Um, I've got, you know, really detailed preliminaries. I mean, if you look at somebody like Mark Schultz, I mean, they're every, those pencil preliminaries he does are completely finished. I mean, you know, they're, they're independent, completely finished works of art. Um, and then you look at like the one that I, that you just showed from George's and, you know, it's purely part of his process. Um, the fun thing about George's and I talked to him about this when we, when I saw him at Heroes and I actually got a full book. Um, that hasn't come out yet of, of, of full 22 pages of preliminaries mm -hmm. from a, a single book. Um, and he still works the same way as he did, you know, when that piece was done, he, I think it was 2002. So he's been doing this a long time. He does a thumbnail and then he does a four to a page preliminary. And then he refines that to a two to a page preliminary. And he uses that to light box to make the final piece. Um, and he's done that for, you know, he's like, Hey, it ain't broke. I'm not going to fix it. I, it <laughs> has worked for me. And people always say, why it's, it seems like a lot of work. And it's like, yeah, but it's, it's the process that gets me where I want to be with my work. And I, you know, I love it. I have some of his four to a page and some of his, I don't have any of his thumbnails. He said, they're, they're so scratchy that I'm probably the only person who can figure out what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what is the information there that I'm trying to get to, but I love the, the way that you kind of refine and the four to a page is where he works out all of the perspective. So there are all the perspective lines in there and stuff, which I think is super cool because I, you know, I can't even draw a stick. So to see people be able to draw with perspective and show how the lines work and stuff is awesome to me. I love that. Cool. Before we move over to the next prelim that you sent me, I was just going to answer Robert Berman's uh, question. He he, it was was answered by Marcus, but there is actually a uh, not no search for member names, unfortunately. Although it's something that in the next iteration of CAF there will be. Uh, you know, I know it's, it's sort of like you could say it's an oversight, but you can browse by all uh, collectors, and but you and you can also browse to like their last name uh, by uh, letter, right? So you can go to ours and find uh, Benno, or you can actually go to the premium member list and see him there. And we put a filter on that page where if you start typing, it'll filter it down and only show you those people. But there is no search. It doesn't, it isn't integrated into the over, overall site search. But when we do the uh, the next redesign, which I'm talking with some people about right now, you know, we are going to make the search feature be much more advanced where you can literally, like the default search will be searching everything that it does today, but you'll be able to pick right from the search box. Do you want to search uh, gallery owner names, art for sale, art in the classifieds, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, search the forum, search uh, the old comic art L post. Those we're going to build it into uh, into that. So it just makes it much more easier to search the entire site from one place and get all of those things that we really don't make easy. You know, I mean, it's not very easy to get to all of that today, uh, but it will be easier in the next version. I promise. <laughs> well, you know, the one thing that always gets me is I meet people. Um, at shows and things like that. And their calf galleries, they use only an initial. Right. Even like two initials. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, what's your page? Where, you know, was, but, you know, there's, I guess people like a little bit of anonymity. I, I you know, I don't worry about it that much, obviously. My, right. Know, right. Friends. Well, you know, I mean, sometimes it's a work related thing. They'd rather, they don't want people to know they collect things in the comics world or sure. uh, yeah. just privacy. I mean, it, I, I get well, I have clients who like said, I Googled you and all I found was like, you know, Dragon Con. And you know, right. what's that all about? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, you know, it's my, my, my legal career is, you know, uh, taking a backseat to my comic collecting, I guess. <laughs> right. They're looking for something that says Esquire after it. And, and all they're finding is uh, crazy cat. 
uh, strips and but and prelims from superhero comics. Yeah, plus I have a weird name, so people can find it. So that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's a James Jean preliminary. Um, yeah, this is gorgeous. So this preliminary is from um, a uh, a series of uh, temporary tattoos that he did. Um, and I love his work. I mean, I just, you know, and again, you know, his comic work, pretty expensive. Obviously, his paintings are ridiculously expensive. Um, but if you look at the comic stuff he did, and really even these, every bit of the information that's in those final pieces is in these preliminaries, and, and but also in a really delicate way, just, you know, beautiful. Um, the, the interesting thing about this one was that um, one of the pieces, that top piece, is upside down. So he right. turned the paper when he worked on it, which makes it a little weird when you're displaying it um, because the, the top piece is upside down. But um, but just, you know, loved it. I, uh, I bought this directly from James, um, you know, right about the time when it came out. Um, so he used to have, he had an online presence and he would post these preliminaries and Every time he posted one, they'd be gone in like two seconds. I mean, you just immediately they'd be gone. And I was like, God, you know, I, I never can get one. I never can get one. I wanted to get one. I just couldn't get one. So I reached out to him online and I said, look, I want to buy, buy something from you. I have never had any luck. How about this? I want to buy the next one. I don't care what it is. I just, uh, the next one you post, you don't have to post it. I just want to buy the next one. And so he sent me an image and said, do you want, I was like, yeah, I told you the next thing you did, <laughs> is, I want the next thing you did. And then he should, he said, these are the next two that I would, I'm doing. And I said, well, I want both. And so he graciously let me buy them both. Um, I, and I had those for several years and then I reached back to him. I said, are you still doing that? And he goes, well, I'm not, you know, because he stopped posting them and stopped selling them through his site. And I said, well, you're still doing preliminaries. You know, is there any way I could get another one? Um, and he sent me this and told, and offered this to me. Um, so I, and I immediately snatched it up. So, you know, again, love the piece, love seeing the work. Um, and he, like, I would say like Mark Schultz, he does very detailed work in his preliminary. So when you see even the stuff he posts now um, on Instagram, uh, you can see that the preliminaries for his major paintings are just like this. They're pencil pieces. They're usually small and, but they have all the information of the final piece. Um, now, the early ones that I got from him, and it just amazed me. And I, I, was, I was like, you know, he's doing these, and obviously his work's expensive now, but for the economy of what he was doing, he was actually taking eight and a half by 11 paper, folding it in half and doing his preliminaries on half of it, and then doing another preliminary on the other side. Um, so a lot of the ones I have have either like a full preliminary on one side and on the other side there's like a sketchy preliminary it's just amazing to me and i don't think he does that anymore because i'm sure um there's a lot of demand for that material so there's no reason for him to you know economize and do him on two sides of a piece of paper he can use as much paper mm -hmm. as um but yeah just love the pieces and excited to have them so it so it pays sometimes to reach out to the artist we've talked we, we say that a lot too it's like sometimes if you really want something ask you never yeah, know don't ask don't happens. get that is that is the rule if you don't <laughs> ask you definitely won't get right um, yeah you, so you uh, gotta dig sometimes and uh, take chances yeah and just reach out to people mm -hmm. I, you know i when people used to have their names in the phone book i gotta tell you there were a lot of people who reached out to artists just sure like, knew where they lived and just looked them up in the phone book um and you know i I've done it myself. I mean, you know, I haven't done it in 20 years, but back when there were phone books, they haven't, they haven't printed that, phone books in 20 years. You know, yeah. I, you could, you could do that. Um, I, I looked up Kaz, the uh, underground cartoonist yeah. um, uh, in New York. And I looked up his name um, because he did an interview in the comic bars. God, I had no idea what his real name was. As soon as I found out what his real name was, I happened to be in New York and I just called him up and said, yeah, come on over. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you never know. It's like, you know, sometimes they'd be like, no, nah, you know, I mean, like, you know, Steve Ditko famously, you know, a lot of people knew where he lived. 
if you knocked on his door and you said, are you, you know, shut the door in your face or whatever, but you know, people did it regularly. Sure. Uh, you know, you certainly hear plenty of stories about it, but I said, don't ask, don't get. So, mm -hmm. you know, and there were plenty of people who kept asking for him, I'm sure. Uh, so yeah. So originally you sent me a third prelim, but we, we knocked that one out and I have that. Yeah, there's, I mean, we're already, you know, running, running for a while, so I didn't want to do that. <laughs> but, uh, but here's the piece that you, you, you had sent me one to replace it with. Yeah. So this is Emil Ferris. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, show a piece of her work. I love my favorite thing is monsters is I think one of the best graphic novels that's come out in the last 10 years. I mean, I just, it's fabulous. Um, and her work i mean she does it all with ballpoint pens um this is not a color piece i actually am buying a color piece from her which are done with color ballpoint pens um but this super delicate um look and just and the work itself is just magnificent and i you know i would say a lot of the the stuff that you know a lot of the things that collectors like are very um, oriented towards superhero comics or, or, you know, mainstream comics. This is kind of as far, you know, pretty far from mainstream. Um, but the work is fabulous. I absolutely recommend anybody go out and check it out. And, and the, the quality of the technique that she's using and the quality of her, her line work is just beautiful, gorgeous work. Um, and to see it all done, you know, I mean, we, we've all, I mean, I think most people have seen Frank Cho's, you know, mm -hmm. ballpoint, sure, duties yeah. and ballpoint stuff he's doing. Um, she's doing it, but for a, you know, in, in a different way. I mean, obviously he's doing it and really showcasing women because that's Frank Cho and that's what he's into. Um, she's using this, some of the same types of techniques. Um, and interestingly, like this one, um, this is part of a page that's in that book, but it is not, she takes images like this and the final pages are collaged um, from various different images uh, to create the final piece. Um, in this piece, uh, you know, she was, uh, she is now represented by a gallery in New York, but previously um, she, her gallery uh, show showings were only in Paris. So I actually had to reach out to a gallery in Paris um, and I think it's Gallery Etienne, um, and uh, asked them about getting a piece of art from her. Um, and as it turned out, um, I had a friend who was going to be in Paris for work, and he went and picked them. So, uh, you know, it, yeah, I would say, that's true, Jeff. I, I, I actually thought that that would be exactly what it was, um, but it's not. Um, some of them are, actually, but most of it is not. Um, mm -hmm. Because the way that yeah, I'm not familiar with the book, I hate to say it. Well, I I would tell you, Bill, read it. It's I will. It's a, it's a marvelous story. It's really well done, and it's very interesting the way that she set it up. And as Jeff showed, it it is set up to look like it's done on notebook paper. So there's lines on the paper, and it's like you know done over the lines. It, it's mm -hmm. just wonderful. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to check it out. Without yeah, question. Highly recommend it. Um, so I, I brought it to my book club. My book club loved it. Yeah. And Emil was nice enough to do a uh, a Zoom call with my book club to talk to them about it. Oh, that probably was a thrill, wasn't it? So that was cool. I was just like, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I'm very, you know, I'm very interested. I, I'm in a book club. I'm the guy who always, we don't read, it's not like a comic book club at all. Yeah. Most of the stuff we read is other kinds of things. I always try to put graphic novels in because I think people wouldn't read them otherwise. And now I've got people reading things that I know they would never read. Mm -hmm. So I'm spreading the gospel. You certainly are. <laughs> uh, quick question from Stanley. Uh, he was asking, how does Benno collect by, by art, nostalgia, character? I mean, or do you just, and by art, I assume he probably means, do you just collect things that well, you, I, you really appreciate as an art form versus? Never, never really by care. I, I would say I collect by art generally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I look for artists. That's the first thing I'm looking at. Um, the thing I would say about character is there are characters that I don't collect. Um, I specifically am not interested. There's certain, like, I, I, I don't like the Punisher. It's not my kind of thing. I don't really like the X-Men. 
you know. I was just gonna say you probably don't have a Wolverine in your collection, yeah, right? I just, well, I mean, I do, but you know, like a prelim by sure. just Gen V. But I don't have, you know, it's not something I'm chasing down. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, there's there are things that I maybe shy away from more than shy towards. Now, are there things I collect for nostalgia? Absolutely. I mean, I think I would. I bet that there are, you know, five percent of the collectors who collect comic art who don't have nostalgia pieces in their collection. Um, that's how most people come to collect. They started with comics and then they went back and started collecting the art from comics. Uh, and I just like that. I mean, certainly um, was doing that. But but I I don't know. I didn't I didn't really start that way for the most part because I when I started buying stuff, I was buying people who were contemporaneous. To me. Right. I mean, you know, I, I bought, I mean, like that, the, the rights piece. I mean, it, I bought it in 75. It came out in 74. I mean, I, I wasn't nostalgic for what happened last year. I mean, I, you know, I mean, yeah, I guess you could call that nostalgia, but it wasn't, you know, truly like I read that when I was a kid, I was a kid. Um, so, and I think that I still collect that like that now. And, and so, I mean, I, I buy contemporary stuff that I see now and I go buy it now. Um, now there are certainly things that I would love to get that I have a deep nostalgia for. Um, I think that we all know that it, it's, it has become very difficult to do that. Um, the, the pricing has made it very difficult to collect fully just nostalgically, unless you have a, a very deep wallet, it's hard to do. And I have switched around. I mean, I, I have, I've changed focus more than a few times because the stuff that I like, well, you know, I love cartooning. I mm-hmm. love comic art. Um, so I, when things got, you know, when you couldn't buy vintage Marvel comic art anymore, okay, you know, at the price point that I could afford, I said, okay, well, I'm going to find the next thing that I like. And there's a ton of stuff that I like. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the thing that I would say that, is my collecting philosophy generally is I collect very widely, not deeply. There are few, very few artists that I have six, seven, eight pieces. And more than that is pretty rare unless they're mostly preliminary work. Mm -hmm. Um, But I collect widely. I, I love to have one example by a lot of different people. And I have, you know, if I had would say I have 500 pieces in my collection, I have, you know, 350 different artists. Sure. It's it's that kind of thing. I I don't, you know, um, you know, a lot of people, I just have one thing and, you know, sometimes I try to upgrade that thing or whatever, get the better piece by that person. But I'm a lot of times I'm just kind of one and done. That's more my collecting philosophy is having the piece that I like by that person because I just, there's so many people I like and I, I, you know, I want to get, and if you, and I will tell you, you know, I think it's if you want to um, in, in the world that we're living in now, it's kind of a crummy way to collect. If you want to be able to afford to buy things because trade is sort of is so important because cash is it, 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 you know, it's hard to come up with cash for things. Mm-hmm. And if you only have one piece by somebody. then you can't really trade it because once it's gone, it's gone. Right. So, you know, if you have 10 pieces by somebody, then you have some opportunity to do that. Right. And, oh, I think, yeah. you know, in, in retrospect, you know, mistakes were made because I, you know, I had opportunities, you know, I was like, oh, I have a priest by that guy. I'm not going to buy another two pieces. Well, I was a dumbass. I should have bought two or three pieces because then I would actually, you know, have something that I could trade. But that, that, that didn't happen. So. Well, this past weekend, I picked up my first uh, Milton Kniff. And George Wonder strip. You know, I've always wanted something by both of those guys, and I and I it's it's not an expensive uh, strip for from either one of them. But I had to had to get that first example right, and uh, yeah. And I feel like like what you're saying, you can kind of build off that, but you know, trading it, I, I'd have to be trading for another piece and probably giving trading cash to get to get that next better piece. But you know, right now I feel really happy. I've got an example which I've yeah, been exactly. wanting for so so long because I've seen a lot of. You know, the later the Kniffs, I, I've seen a lot of those on the market and I didn't want to buy those. I mean, they were quite affordable and, and whatnot. So I got about a, a you know a strip that was around $700. So not certainly nowhere near, you know, the stuff that's selling on Heritage these days, but but a, but a very good example for me to kind of start with. And uh, yeah, we can probably get another one. I'll, I'll be perfectly happy just to have that one. Um, we, we talked about uh, uh, previously my, my friend, um, Bob Murphy. 
Yes. So if, you're, if you're seeing a lot of Kniff in the, on, on Heritage, that look at the look at the description. That probably eighty percent of that is going to say from the collection of Bobby G. Murphy. He had incredible, incredible collection. I mean, unbelievable those... collection. And and Kniff, um, you know, he had over five hundred dailies. He had a couple of dozen Sundays. I mean, it just was. You know, if you like Terry and the Pirates, he was the guy. Uh, it had unbelievable. I mean, you know, bigger collection than Ohio State had, and right. it, that's where Milton Kniff left his work. <laughs> it was just, uh, it, it was just astonishing. So, right, and, and uh, those pieces that, are, are, you know, the pieces that you've been seeing on Heritage lately. I mean, you've seen strips go for fourteen, fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars. I mean, there, there's some incredible examples out there. Yeah, so. the, the dailies, and the thing that, killed, uh, you know, it's, he passed away last year. The only thing, I mean, look, he. he his family did what they should have done in terms of, of, of maximizing the value of the work. Mm -hmm. but, you know, they weren't that interested in it. Um, it pains me that I would, that I was unable to convince them that before they split the work up by, by giving it to heritage, that they never had a, a show of his work. Oh yeah. That would have been, just yeah. Because it was just what he was able to amass. Um, in per specifically the, the Terry and the Pirates work mm -hmm. was worthy of being shown. It just, it, you know, the Masters of Comic Art exhibit that they had um, at, uh, um, it was in L the one that was in LA and then came out back to New York. Um, the Kniff stuff was, you know, 70% of it was his. Wow. Um, but You're right. That would have been very fitting, right? I mean, we don't, we honor the, the artist, but we don't often honor the, uh, the people who collect the art and that would have been a a show that would have would have made a lot of sense and would have kind of honored his memory and his diligence as a collector and uh you know an opportunity missed right yeah i really do think so and i and, and i that's exactly i think you said it exactly right we do not really honor the people who put those kinds of things together other than the uber wealthy people who do it and you know start their own museums or something sure could be the arm and hammer collection or whatever it is mm -hmm. but um you know but bob did you know i mean you know he worked i mean he I, I wrote about him in the apple but i mean he was he was born poor i mean not like you know you come out like lower he was poor his father was a sharecropper um you know i mean he, he it was just you know and he made his way he was never super wealthy but he put that collection together piece by piece over 40 years, 50 years, just incredible. So incredible guy. I mean, that's, yeah, I, and I, I never met him. I mean, but I, 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 I always knew the name. Yeah. And you know, and most people didn't meet him. And I, 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 I made it a point if people came to Atlanta and I thought that they had an interest in that kind of work, mm -hmm. I called Bob and I said, can I bring a friend out? Um, and you know, at first he was like, Oh, you know, because he knew he had a really valuable collection. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had to convince him that, you know, look, I, you trust me, you can trust my friends. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to bring anybody out there who's going to steal your stuff, Bob. Um, and so over the course of, you know, years, I brought a bunch of friends out there and I'm happy that I did. And everybody who went, I can tell you was happy that they got to see it because the collection was incredible. Ray's reminding you've been putting your collection together for over 48 years. Yeah, but I never did I, nothing like what Bob would do. I mean, not even a smidgen of what he did. I mean, it was he was focused, and I'm not focused. Mm -hmm. um, he was focused on comic strip art, and then particularly within that, he was also focused on on Kniff. But you know, Kniff was a huge thing. But you know, there were <laughs> he had, he had a really unbelievable collection. I mean, you know, multiple Flash Gordons, multiple Jungle Gems. You know, multiple i mean just all kinds of stuff so it was it was really incredible well it's uh off to heritage now and broken up yeah i mean look if you, you know if you can go to heritage and just i don't know if you can i think you can search on, just search on, on the name yeah search on bobby murphy and you just look at what they've sold i mean they did one sale that was just his and you know with a catalog that was just his right that was a fraction of the stuff i mean they're going to be selling his stuff in you know the weekly auctions and in the bigger auctions for probably a couple of years i mean it was it, just a lot of work so well why don't we uh 
move on to i think we only had one uh, this is this is an interesting piece <laughs> so i love this i'm i'm really <laughs> i'm a self-absorbed guy what can i say <laughs> um, I, you know i have to admit that sometimes my wife would definitely tell you that it's true um and you know about i don't know 20 years ago um i was at a show and ryan sook was there um and i just Honestly, at that, I was like, oh, you know, I was really into Little Nemo. Um, I had, in a moment of financial need, I had sold the little only Little Nemo that I will ever own. Um, and I thought I'd like to get something like that. So I got uh, Ryan Sook to do a piece. Um, and it was fun. I, I, I didn't tell him a ton about it. I said, I want it to be, I want to call it Little Benno in Slumberland. I'd like to be in it. Um, and I don't care what you do. It would be cool if my daughter was in it. Her name's Amanda. And he did a great piece in full color, and it's awesome. And I thought, wow, this is a cool idea. I'm going to do this again. And I did it several times. Um, the thing that I would say that I liked about this piece was I told you that I had uh, taught some classes over at, uh, over at SCAD. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the guys who was in one of the classes was a, um, a guy named Anderson Carmen. And Anderson while still in school did this piece which i think is as accomplished as any of the other pieces i got even you know look i got pieces by frank brunner i got pieces by camolo i got pieces by ryan sook joe dragunas i mean you know just you know some great um comic artists but and this guy was a student and just came up with this awesome piece um you know with gertie the dinosaur i mean if you know anything about mckay it's just it's awesome you know it perfectly encapsulates what was cool about little nemo in slumberland and it also pulls in some of uh mckay's other work and it has me in it which is you know sort of that point um and you know has the end where he's falling out of bed and it just you know and talks about i need a sandwich so it really references um their dreams of a rare bit fiend i mean it just is perfect so um i was uh, it's a it was a, it's been a fun theme um the only thing i can say about this theme um is that i slowed down very dramatically in doing it because uh clearly these pieces are worth a ton to me and they're worth nothing to anybody else <laughs> <laughs> um and you know and you gotta you gotta kind of you know factor that in i mean i don't mind um you know spending some money on things that i know are, you know i mean we all buy things that aren't going to be terribly valuable in the future but, you know, I hate to stick my family with a bunch of stuff that they can never do anything with if they don't want to keep it. So I've I've done seven or eight of these. I probably will not do any more of these. Just Or if I do, I will do inexpensive ones. You know, I, I actually, somebody's working on one right now who was a SCAD student because I think it's, it's a cool thing for them. And I think it's a good learning exercise to look at Windsor McKay's work um, and then come up with a concept. Uh, I think it's a it's a super cool thing, and um, for Anderson and for the woman who's working on the one that I'm doing now, you know, it's a way to get paid professional work and to learn to like do commissions for people um, that aren't you know your friends. I mean, neither I mean neither of these people, you know, Anderson didn't know me. Um, the woman who's doing the one now, Lucy, doesn't know me, um, but I'm paying her, and you know, she's and he was very good about staying in touch with me and you know and i think it's a good way to learn professionalism too so i feel like i'm doing them a favor and they're doing me a huge favor yeah no that's uh that's great and you mentioned uh, joe dragunas i really love his work too he's oh, he's well, fantastic the piece he did for me is awesome and it's personal which is you know even more so than some of these because he knows me these guys you know they're doing pieces that are personal to them and obviously to some degree to me but joe did one personal to me because he know he knows me which mm -hmm. is a really cool thing so uh, it's uh that that makes things really special rich wanted clarification on the uh... um the, there's a they do a history of cartooning class um and about halfway through the class um i usually come in and and i try to show a uh, you know, I bring a Windsor McKay. I have a, a, a rare bit thing, but I try to bring stuff across um, along, uh, you know, through through the history of comics, comic, comic strips. I bring some Golden Age work. I bring some Silver Age work. I bring modern work. And I bring some preliminary work 
all so that people can see the the gamut of the kinds of stuff that um, has been produced over you know the 125 years that you know comics have been being produced in America. Mm-hmm. All right, let's. Uh, we're changing the theme here a little bit. You know, this was one of the old oh, you know, older pieces you had, but this is a this is a beauty. Jack Davis, yeah. man, I uh, I I always wanted to get EC art. You know, I've been looking. I, I bought uh, two things from when Russ Cochran was uh, doing. I bought a Jack Davis story and I bought a Johnny Craig cover. Um, I actually traded both of them. Um, I traded the Jack Davis story for a different Jack Davis story. I traded the uh, Johnny Craig cover for a different Johnny Craig cover. Um, but uh, I I had the opportunity to meet Jack, uh, which made it even more special to collect his work. Um, and, uh, and I just, it is amazing to me the quality of the line work, the inking he did. Um, if you look, he used razor cuts to create the, the, um, the shattering uh, and, the, and the bullets uh, across this. Um, if you you can just look into that that dark ink in that uh, in that splash and see where he like you know put that ink down and then cut into it with a razor um, to get that white on black look. Um, it's funny when I I you know Jack didn't get any of this work back. I mean he got some of the later work from Mad back. But he got zero back from this era, from the you know the early 1950s, um, and I brought him a page and asked him to sign it for me. And he was he looked at it. He goes, "My God, I was good back then, wasn't I?" <laughs> <laughs> he was he was like, "I can't believe that I could ink that well." You know, I mean, just looking at it, he's like, "It, it and it, you know, it's true." I mean, it's just the the quality of the work is just unbelievable. And and Jack had the facility to, there was always, a, even in the goriest horror or even in the, um, you know, the, the grimmest, you know, war stories he did, there's always a, a slight element of humor, which I think is interesting. And it, you didn't think about it that, but he could just, you know, he, he, and he was able to do work in just about everything. I mean, he did comics, he did, uh, cards he did movie posters he did books um he did time magazine and other covers and uh for magazine work i mean he he did animation um he worked across virtually anything that you needed a drawing for jack davis did it and he did it well um at one point um in the 70s he was the highest paid illustrator in america he you know i mean he just he was you know putting together things like the, the TV guide covers and, the, uh, you know, I mean, and he could, and he worked fast. That was the other thing. And they all talked about that. I mean, that was one of the things that Bill Gaines talked about. Sure. You could give oh, something yeah. to Jack Davis and you'd get it back in a few days. Uh, whereas, you know, Wally Wood would take, and, and look, I'm not taking anything away from Wally Wood or any of the, you know, the great cartoonists at EC, um, you know, Graham Ingalls and, you know, Al Williamson and stuff, but Jack could work fast and, still turn out unbelievably good work um so you know it's definitely um i traded for this piece uh with my friend steve stein another appa member uh was thrilled to get it just love this love 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 this piece um so uh you know I, I think and that's another little piece of my collection is ec work i don't have a ton of it but i have i've tried to get pieces by the people i love i still looking for that elusive Wally Wood page and, and an Al Williamson page, but you know, eventually hopefully that'll come my way. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never owned anything by three, all three of those you've just mentioned. I mean, but they're all, they're all on my list, right? I mean, if you yeah. want good examples from uh, some of the best comic creators, I have a Wally Wood, but I don't have any, and I have an Al Williamson, but nothing from EC. Ah, nothing got from it. that era. Nothing from that um, era. Yeah. I'd like to have. Nope. I agree. I agree. So uh, here's a, we're going to switch gears a little bit on this one too. So moving over to Tim Sale. Uh, this one kind of makes me want to cry, frankly. Um, you know, Tim, it's still very raw to me. Um, Tim's passing. It, just to, I mean, if you knew him, you knew he was a great guy. Just to, uh, you know, um, 
I'm I'm happy that I have his art. I'm much happier that I knew him. He's just a wonderful person. Um, and uh, this piece was a commission. Um, my wife had seen um, Captain America movie. It was her favorite Marvel movie. And, you know, my wife's not a hugely superhero kind of gal. Um, so um, when I told her I was talking to Tim about something, she said, well, get a Captain America. I like Captain America. Um, so... Um, and the thing that was different about this piece, and I think different from most of the, the commission work he did, I asked him if he would do it um, in a horizontal aspect as opposed to a vertical aspect. Um, so it's on 11 by 17 paper, but it's, uh, it's turned sideways. Um, and that was something that I wanted. Um, and um, so uh, when I got it, uh, I actually picked it up at Heroes um, in 2015. And uh, so, uh, I, you know, and just was blown away when I got it. I was like, wow, okay, you, can, yeah, you certainly killed it. You know, he had just finished the Captain America book. I think everybody knows that that was a somewhat troubled book. I mean, you know, he did the first issue and then it, and then there were literally a couple of years between that and the next. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, there were issues with, you know, that, thank God were resolved, you know, between him and Jeff, you know, along the way. And it was Jeff Loeb. And so I, I you know, it, I think it, it was interesting. He, he had finished it and it had been painful to get it done. And actually when he was done, he was like, yeah, I'd actually like to do a cat piece now that I don't have to like, you know, that's not part of the book. You know, it's just, I, I feel like that parts behind me. I can enjoy the character again. Um, and I think it showed in this piece. I, you know, it really was, you know, it's a beautiful piece. And then, you know, in one of those great things that every collector, I'm sure, likes to, would want to hear um, about, I don't know, two years after I got this piece, Tim called me out of the blue. And he said, uh, Benno, uh, you know, it's kind of weird to ask you this, but he said, Marvel, uh, for whatever reason, has decided that they do not want to pay me to do a new cover for the hardcover uh, collection of Captain America. Um, would you mind if I use your commission for the cover of that book. And I was like, would I mind? Are you kidding me? And I was like, yes. Um, it's so, every collector's like, dream, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like my commission became a cover for, you know, the hardcover collection. Awesome. Um, so, but you'll, if you look at the cover, you'll see what they did was they, obviously he didn't use the Captain America, which he handed at the bottom, but um, he just took the center of this, which is the Bucky and Cap, and the flag and stuff um and then but inside that hardcover it is the the whole the whole thing is the end papers for the front mm -hmm. um so you get the whole image inside but the cover is he he had it um uh, color uh you know for the front so um you know a lot of meaning to me it was you know just fabulous piece um i have you know i have several other pieces by Tim, I, you know, along the way, I've, you know, certainly I've gotten published pages and commissions and drawings and things like that. But, um, you know, this one's super special. It's, uh, it's in our den. Um, I actually have an old small easel and, um, one of the, and you see that it's just in a mat. It's actually not framed. It's just in a mat. Um, so, uh, you know, I can get right up on it and look at it, which I do fairly regularly. Um, but it's, uh, you know, a memento of somebody that I, you know, just, I, you know, love the guy. He was, he was a super good guy and, and really accessible to the, it, he was a person who just appreciated the people who appreciated his work mm -hmm. and, and was very generous to them. And I, you know, and I was, uh, lucky to be a, a beneficiary of some of that generosity, um, and, you know, I, I participated for several years, more than a few years um, on a, uh, he had a, a, a chat board. Um, there was a, uh, that I think him and uh, several of the guys like Matt Wagner were all under um, the same, uh, under the same chat board. But he had this amazing chat board that was, and it wasn't just about his art. It was about music and films and books and anything you want to write about. There was like a thread for it. And he participated in all of them. I mean, he was just, he would jump in and talk and, um, you know, just, it, it was, it was really a, a everybody who participated that in, in any kind of real way, all 
just, you know, are deeply nostalgic for it. I can tell right. you. Walked away richer from, uh, from the experience. You yeah. know, I didn't, I really didn't know Tim very well. I mean, I hate to say it. I mean, I regret it now, but I mean, I remember seeing him at shows all the time and, uh, never really went up and talked to him. I mean, I never even commit, you know, I got a con sketch or anything from him, but I always had different agendas at any of the shows that I saw him at, but I definitely regret that now. Um, but, um, you know, he's, uh, he's definitely missed in a lot of ways and his style was just so unique. You know, he really stood out, uh, with a very, uh, individual creative uh, voice and, and, the, and the way he approached the the ink work. I mean, I, I was just always impressed by his style. I mean, you, 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 anything you saw by him, you knew it was his work, right? And, uh, yeah, and it was amazing to me that he was able to do an a have a style like that that was really off model mm -hmm. um, from what the mainstream of of the characters he was doing. I mean, he worked in mainstream comics. I mean, he did. You know, he was doing Batman. He was doing Superman. He was doing Captain America and Hulk and Spider-Man. But every one of those things, he brought his own vision to it. And it wasn't like anybody else's stuff. It didn't look like other people's stuff. Um, and yet it it was able to penetrate, you know, um, in into pop culture now. I mean, the, the work that he did for, you know, The Long Halloween and um, Dark Victory and, uh, and, you know, Superman for all seasons and that stuff's going to stay in print, you know, probably as long as I'm alive. Um, and I just, you know, it, it's amazing to me that he, it, it is, uh, they're not that there are certainly plenty of people who are doing that now. I don't think there were plenty of doing people doing that, you know, in the early nineties. Right. No. All people they're, they, they are looking for people. And I think probably partially because of Tim, that they are looking for people who can bring their own individual look to characters and stuff. But I think he's one of the people who showed them that that was a really valuable thing, that everything didn't have to look the same. And in fact, if it didn't, it resonated more deeply with people. Well, I, I agree with you completely. I know I really do. Um, sorry for your loss and everybody, you know, who uh, were fans of his, I mean, he had a huge fan base. Uh, so yeah, absolutely tragic. I mean, we've lost far too many creators in the last uh, couple of years. Know, it's it's just, been it, yes. really a miserable yeah. time, to be quite honest. I know people, you know, Neil Adams, there are lots of people, but, you know, Tim hit me hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he was a friend of mine, so I just it was in a different kind of way than, than um, you know, just the loss of a creative force. It was a loss of, of him. Right. It's, uh, uh, yeah. Well, why don't we... Uh change the subject a little bit a guy who i guess when he kind of came on the scene had a very uh, different voice as well that uh, fortunately people were allowed to uh, they allowed him to work in in uh some pretty important books in his time so uh, you know this this piece has got to be one of the i'm probably i bet you this is probably one of the more commented and more more viewed pieces in your calf gallery i mean it's a oh, sure it's a piece of comic art history here yeah it really is i mean when you talk about you know sort of you know museum piece this is the piece that i have in my collection that i you know think yeah that's probably a museum piece kind of piece um it was funny i was talking to some people earlier but you know i was saying i was i'm, I'm a cheap bastard <laughs> and uh they said oh yeah you gotta you know you, you can afford to say that you got a dark night piece um and you know but i i as i've told people and, I, and i'm i'm not coy about it i mean i i didn't pay that much for it I, it was it was eight hundred dollars i bought it in 1987. Um, right after the book came out, um, it was, uh, you know, I, I've talked about it on Felix's show and he's got that picture of, uh, that I, that I gave him that he posted of Scott free, who was the guy who was selling stuff for, uh, for Frank at that show, um, you know, holding up a page from the book. Um, and it was one of the pages I didn't buy because I wanted to have a picture of the one that I didn't get. Um, so, but you know, at that show, um, I bought, I, I bought a page from book one and I bought this one or um, there was another the the other splash um, of Batman on the horse that was from the side view um, was 50% more expensive than this one um, it was lucky for me that I liked this a lot. I was like this works out well I like this a lot more than that one and it's you know a lot less expensive so um, so actually um, I was thinking that was about how much money I want to spend. So instead of getting one piece, I got two pieces, um, which was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's, 
I don't know. I, I love the, um, how this is drawn. I love the composition. It just, I mean, it is amazing to me that, that dark V and then the dark undershadow of the horse and the white and the way the cape cuts across the, the black on the right side. And, you know, the way that you have the, the white characters, you know, in forming that, that V, you know, on the left below his, the left leg there. And it, it creates that same like triangular shape. It, it's just, it's just magnificent to me. I mean, there, there's a, you know, there's a reason it's, it's, you know, uh, people want to look at this because it is really beautiful in, you know, um, it is a great piece of comic art. Um, and, and I'm proud to own it. That's all I can say. Um, you know, thrilled. It was, uh, I, I actually brought it when, uh, when I was on, um, uh, Felix's, uh, podcast, I brought it with me and I actually, I was reframing it. So I had it unframed and it was lucky I got to bring it in, and, um, uh, in a portfolio, which was nice. And, um, and I got Klaus Johnson to, to sign it for me, which was awesome. I had had, I, I got Frank Miller signed it for me probably in, I don't know, 1992. Uh, he came to Dragon Con. Um, but I had never met Klaus and I brought this to the show and he signed it for me. It was super gracious. Um, and uh, afterwards, uh, I got to go out to dinner with him and Tim Sale. So it was one of the great con heroes conventions probably that I'll ever get to go to. Um, mm -hmm. It was just great in every particular. Now, had you picked up works by Frank before this one? Or was it specifically because of the book that you were interested in it? Um, I, you know, I loved Dark Knight as soon as I read it. I mean, I, I was very... Um, it, it just like everybody else. I mean, in 1986, man, it was, you know, I've been reading comics for a while. And in that year, I mean, you had Dark Knight, Watchmen, and Mouse was collected that year. It had obviously been coming out in Raw before that. But those three books came out the same year. And it was just like this whole thing about, you know, in the, in the context of being, you know, in my, I guess, um, in my twenties um, and it was comics that were written for me. I wasn't, you know, that wasn't written for a 13 year old. It was written for a 25 year old, you know, it was, it was just an amazing thing to me. Um, and this book was emblematic of that in a way that, you know, even though I enjoyed the daredevil books that had come out before um, it, it just, this was different and it, it, it was, you know that had that they almost created a new format for it with that with the um the square bound or you know perfect bound book mm -hmm. and you know you, you had this book that was beautifully drawn that had a different look for batman than it had ever been done before um and there was unabashedly not for children not little children i mean it was i mean kids can enjoy it i think young teens can enjoy it but it's not for an eight-year-old or a 10 year old, I don't think. I mean, I think a 10 year old maybe could enjoy it, but not the way that an 18 year old could enjoy it or a 25 year old could enjoy it. Um, and so, you know, when I, I, I had no idea when I went to San Diego that year that this was going to be there. But man, as soon as I saw it, I beelined over there and bought something. Now, incredibly fortunate. And I mean, just amazing that you've been able to hold on to it for so long because, I mean, Jeff, it's, I had mentioned uh, wondering if, about what offers you've got, but I can only imagine. I mean, people. I'm sure you've been you've had many inquiries. You would you would yeah. not be you're not lacking in a list of potential suitors for this one day if you were no. in a financial bind. No, that's true. You know, and I I've told people before that you know when I was able to get my daughter through college, um, she started college in 2009, and I thought mm, there's a chance I might have to sell this book to get her through school. Um, but I didn't, and I was very, very grateful that, that I didn't have to. And once she was out of school, I figured, you know, then and unless right, that's it. everything falls yeah. apart, I, you know, I did, I did the major thing in terms of like the financial thing that I had to do as a, as a parent was to get my kid out of college with no debt. And I did mm -hmm. that without selling this. And I was very happy about that. Right. Um, and she's told me that she wants it. So I don't think it'll ever get sold. 
then there you go. That's perfect. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going through the same thing right now. My second kid's in college and I don't, I want to pay for everything. I don't want to show, you know, have any, I, I, I left college with, with some debt, you know, and I, and it took almost 10 years to pay it off and it wasn't excessive, but you know, I don't want to ha have that uh, burden on my kids either. I want them that, to that have as many opportunities as possible with that. My did that for me. I wanted to do that for my daughter. Mm -hmm. That was, I felt like that was my obligation get her through school without debt, man. It, you know, and look, everybody can't do that. I mean, I don't think it's, no, it's not easy. incumbent on you to do that, but I only had one kid. So I felt like, you know, it was something that certainly was within my reach. And I felt like I had to do it and I did. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah. No, without, without, without question. But yeah, that's a, that's, that's a wonderful piece. I mean, it's yeah, you say it's, look, it's behind me. You know? <laughs> I know. I was going to say <laughs> there, you know, it is on my wall. It's, you know, it's on my, you get to see it every wall. day. Um, yeah. I see it every day. I, I, I move it around that this one. I said the the foster, I never move this one. I actually move around. It's always in somewhere, but it, it moves around a little bit. Well, yeah, Michael Callahan says we're both awesome dads for doing that for our kids. So thank you. You know, it's not easy. <laughs> I will tell you that. So, um, <laughs> no, it's not. It is not um, easy. Let's see. We got four more pieces to look at here. Okay. So let's see. A uh, little change here. Oh, so we talked about commission pieces. So this one's interesting. Um, this is, uh, you know, I'm on, I'm, I'm on Jeremy Bastian's uh, Patreon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm at the level where I get a small drawing every month. Um, and I didn't really think about it, but uh, for a little while. And then, you know, I'd gotten five or six or seven drawings. And I thought, you know, I love these drawings, but man, it would be great to have a bigger piece. So I asked him if I could combine some instead of getting a small piece every month. Um, just combine several months in a row and get a piece. And three years ago at Heritage, I mean, at, at Heroes, he brought this piece. And you talk about like commissions when they like exceed your expectations. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. My eyes just popped out of my head when I saw this piece. It is the, the Mobius strip aspect of it. The way you see the, that, that square on the outside is, is it goes around. It actually shifts from one direction to the next um and then you get that that, that three-dimensional square look so it, sometimes it looks like the top is the top is is uh popping out sometimes it looks like it's pushed back uh, depending on how you look at it just love this piece and i gotta say if you've never looked at anything it, you can't you can't see it i i couldn't make a scan i mean i guess i could this is a photo i it's not a scan it's behind glass um you got to see the thing in person the the i do not know how he can draw this way without going blind that there is the the line work is so tiny and so it's just incredible um just an incredible artist super nice guy um and uh, you know, I really think you know, he works slowly and meticulously, um, and but the results are just fabulous. Just, uh, you know, I think he's really one of the great modern uh, comic artists. Uh, you know, he doesn't really do very much in, I mean, doesn't really do anything, um, you know, for like the big two or anything like that. He does his own thing. Uh, you know, he does some commission work that's that's more maybe recognizable characters he's done a little nemo before he's done wizard of oz um things like that but really most of his effort goes into doing uh his cursed power girl stuff and this is a cursed power girl piece um but that you know it it just it's incredible i you know um if anybody ever has the opportunity to you know uh come see me at the house you know ask to look at this because it is worth just staring into for a few minutes it's um the line work is just incredible yeah i've been a i, I love his work it's it's absolutely beautiful there was peace in the uh, in the hero auction right that, that yeah, was, there was and that it wasn't well wasn't it was, it was, he did us he did he did it and i mean every dot it was just unbelievable I and i saw somebody was in line in front of me kind of looking through it and he and he walked past it and I, and i stopped and i just kind of stared 
And I, he looked back and he said, like, you know, like, what do you look at us? You know, kind of much messy. Look at the, get up on this piece and look at it. If you look at it from two feet away, it's like, um, it's like pointillism. You, mm -hmm. you know, it merges and, and becomes oh, yeah, you wouldn't you know. see the image. But if you get up on it, it it's just unbelievable. The, the amount of detail in it, it was, it's just astonishing. It really is. I agree. Uh, Mikhail got that piece during the auction too. I was, I was uh, happy for him because I, yeah. I knew it. it's a, it's a great one. I, you know, I definitely, I, I thought about chasing it a little bit. I, but I have some great pieces. I'm not going to, I, I'm, well, that, that, that I, is I, one I of them. One, the first piece I ever bought from him, I bought it at that auction. Oh well, yeah, really? I got lucky because it was one of the pieces that rolled onto the Sunday morning auction. Oh and yeah. It was, it was a sketchbook cover and I, you know, and I, I jumped on it. <laughs> um, I was unable to get a sketch from him. That was the first year I met him. I, and in, you know, he does one sketch a day cause that's, mm -hmm. and you know, a small sketch every day. Um, and I couldn't get one and man, I was so thrilled to get that piece. And then I immediately joined that Patreon. As soon as I bought that, I was like, oh, you have a Patreon? I got to do that. And I think yeah. Patreon's cool. It's interesting. I've gotten to You know, I've no, I actually have never supported anybody on Patreon, although I always think about it and I never do it. I was, I'm actually on Jeremy's Patreon right now, just kind of checking out the price levels just to see kind of uh, what's available. He does have a lot of, a lot of interesting options in there. Yeah, I mean, but you know, there's even the one where you get a sketch every six months or something is yeah. Is there's ones where you can get sketches every, you know, if you just you know lower level where you can get a sketch every couple of months. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was you know, I, I I fell hard. I'm I'm one of those guys who gets a sketch every month. <laughs> right, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> no, I was, you know, um, you know, it's a bigger commitment, but I you know I was willing to, to take the uh, take it and run with it. Um, all right. Well, now we're shifting the gears again a little bit. We're gonna be looking. This is a Frazetta piece. Oh man! I mean, Frazetta. What can I say? From childhood, always thought. You know, I mean, he was. Look, he's the greatest fantasy illustrator. You know, of the 20th century, and as far as I'm concerned, of the 21st century too. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know, I mean, just you know, I, I just love his work. I you know and I never really, I, I just didn't think I'd ever be able to have a color piece. No, look, I don't have a painting, you know, full, full on painting. This is a preliminary. Um, it was done for uh, one of the Ed Grice Burroughs books, um, Land of Terror. Uh, it is actually, um, he redid the Land of Terror. The, the second one is the one where like with the giant, uh, where he's thrusting a, a spear through the alligator, which is, just an unbelievable painting but mm -hmm. this one you know look dinosaur girl barbarian you know all those kinds of things you know cool um uh you know it's got his great uh his signature um and i think uh, and it's a prelim i mean this fits right into prelim. 30 percent of your collection right yeah absolutely and one of the things that amuses me and interests me because um of how he you know treated his work i mean i think a lot of the people who own either drawings or smaller pieces like this know that you know they're sometimes coffee stains and things like that because he just you know and except for the final final piece that's just not you know he, he they were preliminaries i mean they were they were working they were just things he was doing you know there are pieces that you know where the tops torn off or whatever or they're you know whatever they're not like in, in perfect condition. This one, if you look at the upper, the very top of it, you see like a little U shape. It was a paper clip that rusted. <laughs> so well, it's that gives us, I was going to ask you what the size was off. on this. Is, you know, it like five by eight, eight, something like that? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's about five by eight. Yep. And, you know, and I just, I love that, that kind of touch that it's actually got that paper clip, that rusty paper clip piece there. I mean, that some people might think that mars the piece. For me, it actually adds to the piece. Um, so because it it, it creates, I don't know, it, it almost to me it, it like created a personal, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Mike Callahan got it. It gives it more character. Yeah, that's exactly what I would say. Um, it, it And to me, it's just, um, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing. And 
I will. Uh, I see that um, KD is there um, on the on the chat. Thank you, my friend. Always thank you. Um, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, he did. I did get somebody else to buy this for me, but uh, it was not. Yeah, there was a lot. There's a much longer story that's too long for this. I've already gone way, way over where we thought we were going to be. Um, but yeah, it's, it, there's a long story. It's beautiful. To it. I've always wanted a Frazetta. I mean, I'll never own a, a color piece, but I, I'm still always on the lookout for just any doodle, right? I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. I yeah, mean, and, and I am one of those people who have been burned twice by buying fakes. Really? Twice I bought sketches that were fake. Oh, that's terrible. Um, so and how did you discover they were fake? I mean, uh, um, the because I saw the real ones. <laughs> so, uh, all know, right. And, 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 you know, I just, I wasn't, you know, a lot of times the, you know, a lot of his stuff until they really published all of his material you know, mm -hmm. I just didn't see the pieces. I, I you know, I'd never seen it before. And then sure. when I saw the originals, I'm like, oh shit, that's you know, that's oh, <laughs> mine looks a lot like that, but it's not that. That means it's mine's fake. Right. Um, that's how you can tell. I mean, with all the Schultz fakes out there too, right? I mean, yeah. there's they're they look right, but then when you can compare it with a, with one that is right, you know it's not. You know it's not. Yeah. So um, the first one, uh, I traded a Prince Valiant panel for. Um, which is which sucks. <laughs> um, and the second one I paid cash for, and um, it was, um, you know, I, I, I didn't realize. And I that one, the first one actually, um, I traded to a dealer who then sold it. And then we found out it was fake. And that was years later. And I don't even, I have no idea who has that one. I don't know. It's a, um, the one of, uh, it's an Indian girl. Uh, with a, a bow and arrow and she's holding it um mm -hmm. I, I you know i bought it from some guy at a convention and i you know sold it. so i and that was 30 years ago so i have no idea where that piece is now um the other one um i marked it as a fake and i kept it so that it wouldn't i didn't destroy it but i marked it as fake so nobody can be fooled by it i brought in pen on the back it says fake right <laughs> so you know it's a reminder to me but nobody else is going to get fooled <sighs> I, I always hate hearing stories like that. I mean, there's so much, uh, you know, there's so much fake art on uh, on eBay that gets kind of peddled around. I mean, you have, everybody has to be, you know, very careful. Yeah, I, you know, creators. eBay some, but man, that live auctioneer site. And I, that, yeah, I would agree oh there too. God. I don't even look too often over there. It's unbelievable the amount of fakes, and you know, and now what they've started to do just to like get, they put in the manner of. In the manner of right, and like, you, you, know, you have to avoid that. Uh, they, allow, they allow the titles to be, you know, to, uh, to 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 convince you that it's not. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, I I don't know. There's there's a lot of issues out there in that in that market. Yeah, but yeah. And, and look, I mean, we we live in a world where the values of these things have risen so much that it's worth faking them. I mean, mm -hmm. for were worth faking thirty years ago. Now, you know. I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and what's depressing to me about it is, is that it means that it's almost impossible to buy a drawing by people like a, a Dr. Seuss or, or Scholes without, I mean, you can't because it's almost not even from a gallery. If you're buying it from their hand or maybe his widow or something, you know, you just cannot prove the provenance enough mm -hmm. to, to buy anything that's not published. I mean, you just can't because who knows what it is. Yeah. Um, and that's depressing because, you know, it would be nice to maybe buy Dr. Seuss. I mean, we all read those books as a kid and I would love to have one, but I, there's no way you could buy one without, unless you know it was published, there's no way you can buy one now because it could easily be a fake. And it, and I think, you know, regrettably his style is, I wouldn't say it's easy to fake, but it's, it's perhaps easy to get close enough. Sure. So. Yeah, and as Katie said, thank, thankfully most Frazetta originals are published somewhere. I mean, even if it was in, uh, uh, you know, there were well, there's been a lot of art books with uh, his work in it, so at least there's a lot of reference material out there that you can kind of go back and look at. But uh, but well, a lot of, not, a lot that, of the one that I just showed that that watercolor that's yeah. never published. No, nope, it's not any of those books. Um, I think it was because of that uh, paperclip stamp. Yeah, probably because of that paperclip. I mean, I know it's real, but it's not been published. Right, right. Well, yeah. 
Uh, well, congrats on having that one. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, we've got two more to look at here. Now, this one's uh, Paul Pope. Yeah, so I I love this piece. I, I wanted to show it um, specifically because of the way that um, it's an intersection between uh, two of my passions, music and art. And I'm a, I'm a deadhead, you know, un, <laughs> uh, unrepentant uh, Grateful Dead fan. And uh, Paul Pope did these, uh, did several pieces um, that he used for uh, CDs in the, that when they've been doing um, some of their live shows, they use these for CD inserts, uh, booklets, he's done covers, um, the inside covers when you open the flap of the CD. Um, and uh, I saw a piece that he had done and I knew that uh, Felix was working with him and I reached out to Felix and he was like, yeah, he didn't want to sell that. And then a couple of years later, um, Felix reached out to me. He said, are you still looking for a, um, a Grateful Dead piece? I think Paul's willing to sell a couple of them. Um, and I said, yeah. And I said, does he have the one that I want? He goes, no, he's not going to sell. He's still not going to sell that one. <laughs> um, but he showed and look, he showed me five or six pieces. Uh, and I picked this one. I love the piece. I mean, I, you know. Yeah, I like that one a ton too, but I really like this. I mean, if you're a Grateful Dead fan, you know, it's got the the, the skull and roses. I mean, it's, you know, a classic uh, Grateful Dead thing. Um, the way it's the rain and the way that the, you see it like hitting the side of the skull and splashing up. I mean, it's just, it's a super cool piece and it is big. Um, it is larger than twice up. Oh, wow. Um, so... Uh, you know, and it's great. I love the paper it's on. It's actually the edges of it are, you know, that like torn uh, paper. It's just, mm -hmm. it's really, it's a fabulous piece. Um, and, you know, it really, I, it, I, I love Rick Griffin. Um, I've got a bunch of pieces by Tim Truman um, that are, that are from his Grateful Dead comics stuff that uh, he's, he's done. Um, and, uh, you know, over the weekend uh, at Heroes, I bought a piece from George Haig that uh, was a, a, a rock and roll poster that he did. Um, actually, probably a bluegrass guy um, because I thought the image was awesome and I love that intersection between music and, and art. I just think it's an awesome thing. I love um, all the 60s poster artists, but even the newer poster artists. Um, uh, the guys at Methane Studios are right up the street from me, and they do fabulous work. I mean, they they did, um, you know, all of, of Dave Matthews' posters probably for the yeah. last six or seven years. And if you've ever seen any of the Dave Matthews Band stuff, it is fabulous. And those guys, you know, I was shocked and amazed to hear that they, you know, their studio is less than two miles from my house. Um, so, yeah, it's, I just – that that intersection, especially between cartoonists – and music is to me, you know, that it hits so many buttons for me. I and mean, we talked about, do you collect for, you know, artistic value or nostalgia or whatever this, you know, this piece, you know, really crosses over to me in a way that, you know, a deep nostalgia for the Grateful Dead. Um, I don't have a deep nostalgia for Paul Pope. I love, love his work, but it's not like a Rick Griffin where somebody he died, you know, 20 years ago and worked on stuff in the sixties but I love the work and I love what it represents. Sure. I mean, there, there's a fair amount of like Rick Griffin kind of prelims, right? For a lot of the work yeah. that he did too. Yeah. And I have a really, really detailed, fine preliminary. I That's somebody that I'd love to get a final piece. By. Sure. Just a, a pen and ink, you know, the prelims are pretty slick though. I mean, a, a oh. lot of the details really nice in those Absolutely. ones I've seen. Um, yeah. I have one that, that I framed in, in my second bedroom that, was uh, a prelim for um, the the poster that he did for his the, the San Francisco um, store that was going to sell his work, um, and it's it says best comics and rock art, and I was like, this is perfect. That's the one for me. <laughs> this has it all. <laughs> it's about comics and rock art. Awesome. It's by Rick Griffin, one of my favorites. It was just the perfect piece for me. All right. Well, now the, this last piece has, uh, um, you know, even I, I don't know the story behind it, although uh, I, I should, but I don't. But here, let's uh, take a look at this. So the facing 
American. Yeah, so here I am. I, I've told a lot of people I'm sort of a cheap bastard, but this is more of a. Um, it's just a, it, these are special to me. I all of these. I have more than a hundred of these. Um, I I saw some. I, I went to an outsider art exhibit. I don't know, fifteen years ago, and there was this guy who who painted on one dollar bills, and he had them a little framed on a piece of, like on a weird little mat or something. And I came home and I thought, yeah, that was kind of cool. And then I don't know why, I, I guess I got a $2 bill. Somebody gave me a $2 bill and change or something. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Um, so I want to say, I don't know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I went to a Dragon Con and J. Scott Campbell was there. And I brought a $2 bill and I asked him if he would do a sketch on it. And he did. And, it, and you know, he did Two Face, which of course for a two dollar bill was perfect. Um, <laughs> and I started asking mostly for people I bought art from. I mean, I've gotten a few of these from people who just did them spontaneously for me. You know, I asked them and they did one, and I, I hadn't bought anything from them. But typically, I, I do this when I buy something from someone. Um, and I asked them if they'll do a two dollar, you know, a sketch on two dollar bill for me. Um, and I have, like I said, I have over a hundred of them now. Um, a few years ago, I went to the framing store that I use. I asked them to create a mat for me, um, that has museum corners so that I can change them out at will. And I change them out all the time. Um, so this one, uh, on the upper left corner, that's a Mark Schultz, um, Next to it uh, is Yams, who works, uh, you know, he's, he's Felix's right-hand guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he just did that for me uh, at Heroes, and it is absolutely, it is marvelous. Um, loved it. Dude. But, you know, thank you, Yams. Um, below that, uh, you've got a Jeremy Bastion. Uh, next to it, uh, that NWA, that's Ed Pisker, as nobody would be surprised to see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the one below uh, the Jeremy Bastion, uh, yeah, Daniel Warren Johnson did that for me at the bar on Saturday night after the auction. Um, we were all hanging out drinking, and I got to tell you, it was just the the spontaneity of that guy. I mean, he his it was like his hand was on fire watching him sketch. It was it was just awesome. <laughs> I can't even tell you. Um, next to that is Bob Burden, obviously the flaming carrot, um, you know, with all kinds of crazy stuff written all over it. Mm -hmm. um, below that, Darwin Cook. Um, next to that, Tim Sale uh, did that piece for me. Um, just, you know, love that joker. It's, it's awesome. Um, then, you know, sometimes people do stuff on the front. Sometimes they do them on the back. Uh, this is a Don Rosa with uh, Uncle Scrooge. Uh, on the back of a $2 bill. And the last one is my friend Dave Newton, who used to be a uh, co-editor of the APA, uh, is a great artist and, uh, you know, a personal piece for me that I love. Um, but, you yeah, know, this is something that I'll, I, I'll continue to do, I think, as long as I collect. Um, you know, I love, I've, I've had friends do them for me. I've had lots of artists do them for me. Um, I, uh, I paid for one once and then realized it was a huge mistake. And I, so if, if people don't want to do them, that's fine. And I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not, I mean, look, I'm, it's a freebie. I'm not, you know, I'm, I have no illusions about that. Um, but, you know, that's part of the, the, you know, the charm of it to me, because if it's, you know, if it's a, just a little doodle, that's fine. And if it's, you know, they want to do more, that's fine too. Um, but uh, I, you know, I love these and, you know, and they're all personal and they all every one of them has a story you know because every one of these are is something that i got directly from the creator none of these are things that i you know got mail you know i mean i know the person i got it from you know 85 to 95 percent they handed it to me they mm -hmm. did it and then they gave me a couple of people have mailed them to me because they couldn't finish them at a show or you know i i bought a piece of art from them and and they're they sent it to me later but they're all from creators that i know and that have done the work just for me and it's just you know it's, it's a great little piece of the hobby that we love i mean you know I, 
you know, there's over 100 creators that I have met and have given me a small piece of their creativity. And I love that. No, that's uh, very, very cool. Uh, Mr. Easy Go Lucky One, know how many of those do you have? I now have about 110 of them. So, yeah, you know, and I, and, and look, I, I will say I've given at least $22 bills to artists and just haven't gotten anything back. They just, oh, they didn't finish it. It's like, and you know, it's two bucks. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work out. It's two bucks. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's like, well, Ranga already said he's not giving his back. So yeah, exactly right. He, he, he spent his dollar 99 right here. Um, <laughs> so right. There it is. Um, but yeah, you know, super fun. So, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely, um, again, one of those things you can only do if you collect comic art. It, mm -hmm. It's not, um, you know, it's not like you can, you know, see if uh, Andy Warhol will do one for you or, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> there you go. Um, and it, it's just one of those things that's special about this hobby that you can meet creators like this um, and, you know, and have them create something for you. Yeah, and for free. <laughs> How crazy is that? It doesn't happen often. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, it really doesn't. You know, and I, I just, and I, I am deeply appreciative of the people who do it. Even, you know, the ones that are, are I mean, look, I, I, like Coop. I mean, all he did was sign his name. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then when I got one from Jim Steranko and I thought, but it wasn't. He didn't. He signed his name with this amazing Steranko signature, but he also put that eye patch on there. And, you know, and that was like <laughs> awesome. You know, it was perfect. So. Get a Nick Fury out of him. <laughs> I just met a Nick Fury. So, That's great. It was, it was super cool. Super cool. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Benno, I knew this was going to be a fun conversation. I mean, I'm sure, you know, we could change topics and talk about art history and sp probably spend another three hours talking. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I know I've gone on and on and I, you know, <laughs> I'll only apologize to people who wanted to see, you know, who, who want to go to bed at 10, but uh, Bill really a super pleasure. And, you know, the, the beauty of these things is it's going to talk to you and just hang out and, chat like we're in the same room which i exactly love. well we got to do that this weekend too which was fun uh, you know i mean that, that again this this whole weekend was great and uh being able to follow up with you here is the yeah, this is a perfect follow-up to that mm -hmm. weekend. so i'm i i'm deeply appreciative of that too um and look i i said i as you know i was one of those guys when you started calf that used to harangue people on the old comic art list yeah. why aren't you a premium member you're using this. This is an awesome thing. You need to support it. I still feel exactly the same way. It's an awesome thing. Everybody should support it. I mean, you you have done a ton for this hobby, and I'm deeply appreciative of that. So thank you. Well, no, nope. hey, I appreciate hearing that, and and I, I certainly I appreciate the guys who early on were were very supportive of us as well because that kind of helped helped us realize we were doing something that was you know, more than just kind of throwing a gallery site together, you know, it meant that people were, were you know, really wanted us to do more. And, and so we tried harder. I mean, we, you know, we kind of, I left my day job when I realized that people cared that much about what we were doing. You know, I just, I stopped, I was an internet consultant at the time. And I just was like, this is where my passion lies and people, people believe in it. And I'm going to stop doing that. I started re any work I'd get, I'd refer to fellow developers in the area. And I just focused on CAF with uh, Maureen and my friend Chris and, uh, you know, made it into what it is today. But, but it was that kind of belief, you know, it was seeing that, that concern. I remember Enrico Salvini back in the old comic art L days, uh, he made a, like a big push in June. So like for the longest time, it was like June was the mo was the month I got the most renewals and registrations because it was uh, it just kind of came around. But it was always fun, you know, it's knowing that you supported it and other collectors, uh, you know, it meant a great deal to them as well. So uh, you know, again, there wouldn't, CAF wouldn't be relevant today if it wasn't for the people who really kind of showed us the light back then, you know, back in the, well, the mid 2000s. It created community. I mean, that's what, I mean, it's an opportunity to see art, but it also was community. And, it's, and what it has become is even more community. And that's, to me, is the beauty of it, is really that you let people um, from all over the world now, like, be able to come together in a way like this and i just i'm deeply appreciative it's it's an awesome thing well i i, I, I would say, so much content out there i can't keep up with it 
but I'm damn glad you're doing it. Well, we try. I mean, we're, you know, I feel like we're still learning. We're still evolving, you know, with, with the site. I mean, there's a, you know, there, I, I learn new stuff all, all the time. I love getting feedback from people. I wish people when they, you know, if they have an idea, send it to me, you know, or if they see something that doesn't work right. I mean, I, I, I always, uh, it's, it's stressful when, when I find out, you know, something's been broken for a year, you know, whatever it might be, obviously it wouldn't be major, but if, it, you know, it's like, why didn't somebody tell me, <laughs> you know, the last 12 months went by, this thing didn't work right. So, uh, you know, people shouldn't be, you know, be fearful of being critical. Cause I don't, I don't view that stuff that way. I, I'd love to get more feedback on the site when we're with things and ideas on how to make it better. I mean, I think most of the best ideas that uh, have happened on CAF in the last 10 years probably came out of emails that, and email, you know, conversations I had with people who were trying to suggest better ways for us to do things. So uh, at the end of the day, it's, this site's for everybody. You know, I'm a collector too. I mean, it's gotta, gotta work for everyone as best as possible. So you should never, never feel like, uh, at, you know, being critical on something with me is, uh, is, is going to make me not like you, <laughs> you know, yeah, please. Exactly. I actually, li I like it more when people are more critical of those sorts of things. Well, also you, you didn't come from the outside into this. You came from the inside out, right? It was, it was your passion that you brought out, you know, so that, that makes all the difference. Very true. And thank you for saying that, Johnny. I'll, I'll look for that premium payment. <laughs> <laughs> it was great meeting johnny in person over this weekend as well i mean there was just so many so many collectors i bumped into it was, it was so so fun i mean you know guys whose names i'd seen forever and then never you know never met them in person at a show this this past weekend was great so again Benno, uh you know this was this was a lot of fun and i'm, I'm sure you know somewhere down the road we should do it again Okay, I'd like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to come up with a few different things, right? <laughs> you know, you've got a few different things that we can look at. Awesome. Uh, so, so listen, everybody, thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, this is a lot of fun. And I, I can tell you now, for the 100th episode of this next Tuesday, Mr. David Mandel will be my guest. Another Felix uh, veteran awesome. on, on several chats, but you know, <laughs> Dave and I have been seen that. Yeah, that's going to be fun. And I'll tell you, it's starting at 10 o'clock because Dave's got a busy schedule. So, and he's Pacific time as well. So, we're going to we're going to start that one at 10 p.m. Eastern. So for those of you who are used to us starting at nine, it's going to be an hour later. But uh, but that'll be, I think, one that everybody would like to tune in, whether they can watch it live or not. Uh, you know, you're definitely going to want to watch it afterwards, afterwards as well, because it was, I'm sure it's going to be as fun as this uh, conversation with Benno was this evening. So, Benno, again, you ever need anything, you let me know. And, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I'll be talking to David Applegate. So, you know, maybe there's some things that uh, with the CFA well, APA that I can do to help out there, too. To see if we can make that happen. All right? All right. Very good. Take care.